welcome to the Queen Anne's County Board of Education uh, meeting on Wednesday 2nd of September 2020. Do I have a motion to go in closed session? Yes, pursuit of general provisions of Article 3-305 and 3-104, I move the board to be in closed session to discuss performance evaluations of appointees, employees, and officials with whom this body has jurisdiction, it considers matters that relate to negotiations and to perform administrative function. I have a motion, do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote of the motion to go in closed session. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. We'll see you at 6 o'clock. Thank you. I, too, have uh, visited a few schools uh, this week to be able to check in on them. Um, we're off and running. And uh, not to say that there's not, you know, anytime you implement anything new that's not 100% perfect, you'll get an update on that uh, shortly uh, in our recovery plan. Uh, Community-wise, uh, August 9th, I had the uh, pleasure of standing uh, with Dr. Kane here in support of her joining me, my colleague, uh, Vanessa Bass, our board member, um, Mrs. Morissette. Uh, it was an outstanding event that was uh, attended by nearly almost 300 individuals. And I am proud to say, uh, not only as an executive team member, uh, but an, as an educator, a longtime educator, uh, I'm very privileged to have the opportunity to stand with Dr. Kane uh, and her leadership uh, that she shows uh, no matter what the situation is or what the circumstance is, uh, her leadership always sign, shines through. Uh, and I think that's a sentiment to the individuals that attended that day. Um, so Dr. Kane, thank you for your leadership. I stand with you. Thank you, Mr. P. And uh, happy to say that Ms. Morissette was there. So thank you for being there for that. I continue to get emails and support um, from NAACPs and board members across the state. And uh, as we know, in Anne Arundel County, they created a resolution in support of um, Black Lives Matter, having superintendents engage their students in conversations about race and just doing the right thing, not putting your head in the sand, act like it's not happening because it's happening all over. And, you know, I'm just really, really grateful and actually overwhelmed by the support. There will be an exhibit in the Reginald F. Lewis Museum, uh, one of the supporters uh, submitted the uh, a protest banner and they will document that as Queen Anne's County history in support of Dr. Kane because of the uh, anti-racist efforts and everybody will see it that goes to the Reginald Lewis Museum so very, nice. very proud about that very nice thank you thank you thank Mr. You, Mr. P. ladies how are you good evening who do you want to start with you want to come up here? Come up front? Please. Yeah, because they can't hear you on the... Yeah, come on up. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. It's okay. It doesn't matter which one I go to. It, it, right, it doesn't matter. matter here. Uh, Good evening. Good evening. For the record. Uh, I'm Alexis Gross. I'm the student board member for Ken Island High School. Uh, so I didn't have a meet with Mr. Schreckengoss, but as students, we have believed that our admin team is working really well and ensuring that all students are knowing what's going on and how everything works. And then just another point was that school etology is working well, but like we just think it's definitely different than what we're used to with Google Classroom. But otherwise, it's been really well. Good, thank you. Very, very good. How many classes yet got on their rail today and got moving? Good. I only have one class. I do three dual enrollment classes, but all my friends have said it's worked really well for them. It's just definitely different than what they're used to. So oh, you've been in class yes. for a while. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. All right, well, thank Very you. Good. Thank you, Alexis. Thank you. Ms. Natalie? Okay, I'm Natalie Smith. I'm the student member of the board for Queen Anne's County High School. And um, Alexis kind of like took it off, but <laughs> I can't really say much on Schoology because I am doing all of my classes at Chesapeake this year. But I did ask my friends as well, like what their thoughts on Schoology and like the entire online learning. And they've all been able to manage it. They said that 
they like how they don't have all of their classes on one day, like being thrown at them to be online and talking to your teacher all day long, like they can manage their own schedule. Um, they said that they can self-pace themselves a little bit more, but like Alexa said, it is a lot different than what we're used to, the Google Classroom and the face-to-face -face learning, but we're managing. That's great, that's good to hear. Thank How you. are you making out with your classes? I'm doing well. Oh, good. Yeah. It's different, but yeah, it's the new norm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we are up to citizen participation. Okay. Um, I'm reading this for the public. Um, we will have people coming in that are sitting outside because we're social distancing. We ask speakers to keep in mind the following guidelines. Speakers should sign a roster including your telephone number and address. Comments should be limited to three minutes in length. Comments longer should be omitted in writing. Questions or statements to this board should relate to matters of general policy or which board has authority. Comments about actions or statements of individual staff members are not appropriate for public comment and we should refer to the superintendent of schools or the board president. If you have specific questions, the board will make sure the appropriate staff member responds to your question. The board respects your desire and right to convey all messages freely, but ask the courtesy to this board and our citizens to respect for all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. Pender, are you gonna let them in? The Thank you so much. Okay. First on the list is Pamela Turner Tingle. How's everybody? Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Hi. Hi. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you for having me. So this is our first public comment since COVID. So we are grateful that the public wants to come in and, and thank you for being the first person. Yeah. So for the record, you are? I am Pamela Turner Tingle, and um, I am a former student here in Queen Anne's County and um, a former parent of a student that was here in Queen Anne's County and now a grandparent. And um, to be transparent, I am also interested in a board seat, um, which is part of the reason that I wanted to come out tonight. Um, my concern is combined with a question, I think, more than just a comment. And um, I know that there has been some difficulty for the students who um, are differently abled with their learning and how it's being administered and those kinds of things. So I wrote it down because I don't want to be flustered. Um, so it's really that I know that we're experiencing a pandemic and things have had to be adapted and adjusted. And I really have been like commending the parents because I know this is difficult for them. Um, even the educators, the uh, community members, anybody who is supporting our students for their tenacity, it's a big, big deal. And in light of those recent and very necessary changes, um, I have been concerned because I was wondering what our report card looks like um, for the, um, I guess it's the, Every Student um, Succeed Act. Um, and one of the things that I was kind of asking myself and wanted to ask you guys is, are we meeting the needs of students in the Title I schools um, while maintaining the balance and equity and administration of education and even the use of resources for students who are not in those underserved populations? And if we're not doing it, um, what do we need to do to find a balance um, for equity and equality and inclusion of all students? Um, so do I get an answer to the question or can, is that something that you guys could speak to? It's not a question and answer session right now, ma'am, but okay. I think that some of your questions will be answered in our, in our presentations tonight. Okay. So you'll be able to watch that on QAC TV later on and, and down the road too, because we're gonna be certainly having updates the next two months. Okay. So, but the Maryland report card has all the ESSA information. So you can see all our schools and all our data. So I was looking for that because I was doing some research prior to coming here. And it's 
um, like check boxes, but it's no real empirical things that say this is what's being done and this is the response to it. So that's why um, you can send me an email. Okay. Okay. And, okay. And ask your question. Okay. Thank okay. you so much. Sure. I Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Nice to meet you. All righty. Bye. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Michelle, you want to wait? Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Mike Katinas. Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah, Tammy. They can take their mask when they're talking. You can take your mask off. Take your mask off. Sure. Thank you. So, for the Put record, sir. On. Good evening. <laughs> How are you? Good evening. Most esteemed board of the Board of Education. For the record, I'd like sir. to thank the board and its members for allowing me this opportunity to speak oh, regarding. Oh, Mike, 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 can you just give your name and address for the record? Uh, yes, sir. My name is Michael Katinas, 104 Governor's Way, Queenstown, Maryland. I'd like to thank the board and its members for allowing me this opportunity to speak regarding the closure of our schools. I have taken the time to research some of the statistics recently released by the CDC regarding deaths associated with the COVID-19 virus. These statistics were released on August 28th of this year. I would be happy to share the information with the Board of Education to validate, uh, to validate its contents and its authenticity. The number of children succumbing to the virus one year of age and younger, 17. The number of children succumbing to the virus between the ages of one and four years of age, 12. The number of children succumbing to the virus between five and 14 years of age, 28. The number of children and young adults between the ages of 15 and 24 years of age, 280. The total number of these deaths total 337. Remember, this is the total number of children and young adults succumbing to this virus on a national level. There is no doubt that I would not like to see any of these numbers reflecting the deaths of our children and cannot imagine the pain that these parents have suffered. The United States has a population of 331 million people. Based on these statistics, the death rate among these age groups works out to be 0 0.000, 0, 0, 1. That's five zeros percent of the entire population of the United States. As a board, you are charged with protecting, educating, and ensuring that our children receive a quality education. We look to you to make decisions that will promote the safety and welfare of our children and promote the values that have made our country the greatest of all nations. I believe that you must reconsider your decision to close Queen Anne's County schools. This is putting tremendous pressure on our children. The environment in which they are now being asked to learn is failing their futures. I would like to give you a case in point. I have a gifted and talented grandchild. He just turned 13 years of age. He is very well versed and rationalizes his decisions. He is well-spoken and prides himself on assisting others to learn. He has often told me that he is now not really learning. He is frustrated with his inability to interact and debate. He has always challenged his teachers as much as they have challenged him. <clears throat> and now, without question, he is unable to challenge or ask significant questions that will increase his knowledge and prepare him for the next level of his education. Realistically, teachers are now giving out assignments to complete rather than teach. They are gifted people. They need to teach. He is not the only one at risk here. He will make it. He will find a way to embrace his future because he can. What about the others that don't have this ability? The ones that need reinforcement and a structured learning environment. You must recognize that the majority of the parents in this county want their children to return to school. The superintendent and unions perhaps want the teachers to stay home. I don't know that to be a fact. 
You are ignoring the science and you are jeopardizing the future of a generation to come, not to mention the desires of parents to have their children return to normalcy. I would like to thank the board for the time that you've given me to express my thoughts. And I appreciate everything you do for the county. And you know, I will always support the Board of Education. I will always support our county. I thank you very much. Thank you. James Knowles. Good evening. Good evening. How are you? You can take your mask off, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So for the record, sir, your name and address? Ah, uh, my name's James Knowles, and I live at 1829 Harbor Drive in Chester, Maryland. Thank you. Can I speak? Yes, uh, can sir, I speak please. Now? Okay. Um, well, I have, a, I have a letter that I mailed to the board about uh, three weeks ago, I have, and I had not gotten a response. So I, don't, I won't bore everybody with going through the letter completely. I would like it submitted into, you know, uh, you know, into the record. Yes, sir. But um, just as an overture of the whole letter, um, uh, it was stated at one point, or we had, you know, the public had gotten wind that there was rampant racism throughout our county and in our school systems. And so uh, I was kind of outraged by that because I'm obviously an African-American male and I have three children inside the school system and I'm wondering where's the racism? That's the question. Uh, my, the big deal for me with this is that if there is rampant racism and uh, the word racism is what I'm really uh, attached to, if there is rampant racism, then I want people going to prison I want people, uh, you know, I want to know who they are and if, if they've been fired. And uh, I would like to have something done about it. And if there's not, then we really have to stop using that word racism. I understand that my sons come back and they tell me at various points in time that there's racist. But there's a big difference between systematic racism and racist, if you, you know what I mean. All right? Individuals are racist. Systematic racism means that from the top down somewhere, there's, uh, you know, people holding back a particular people in this county. If that's happening, I'm upset, and I would like to know about it. Because I should, as a parent, have the opportunity to remove my kids from that environment and or do something about it. And that's the over overture. All right. Thank you, sir. If you could send that letter to all the board members, that would be great. We've received it. I think we've, we've got a copy of it. I think we got, didn't we get, did we get a copy of that? Yeah, okay. sure okay. you got it. Did get a okay, I just never got an acknowledgement of the okay. whole reception of that, too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. I appreciate Nelson. it. Thank you. Thank you, dear. Thank you, sir. Jordanis Schifanelli. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. Good evening. For the record, name and address. My name is Jordana Schifanelli. My address is 103 Wineland Way, Stevensville, Maryland, 21666. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. I'm here because I have been following what's going on with Queen Anne's County Board of Education and with the letter that was issued uh, on, to parents by the superintendent of the Queen Anne's County Board of Education, Dr. A Andrea Kane. That letter was mailed on June the 5th, around 10 o'clock. That letter created a big division in our community and in our county, and it never settled after that moment. Um, I came to America 22 years ago from Yugoslavia. That was a communist country, and I came to the land of free and brave to work and prosper. Instead, I got the letter 
in this county where I lived for 22 years that we are racists and I've been sending my children to racist schools. To me, that is absolutely unacceptable. And I demand that this board condemns this behavior immediately. Number two issue that I have is complete disagreement and disregard to Governor Hogan's school reopening plans. We have fantastic superintendents in the past who have always followed the educational standards to the best of their abilities. And our children in public schools have been educated at the top of the state of Maryland. They've always been at the top. I have three boys and all of my boys have followed the state public school state curriculum and I've been very proud of it. However, in the last couple of years, I've seen a severe degradation of education quality in our public schools. When my youngest son received a Zooming call to talk about his skin color with the suspicious characters, I became very, very upset. I reviewed those individuals through the judicial system and I realized a severely questioning uh, character and a severely questioning process of how our children are exposed to people and who these people are. I'm concerned about my safety, my children's safety, because since I've expressed my disregard to this behavior, I've received death threats, I've received letters sent to my employer to be terminated. I've received serious letters calling me racist, white supremacist, and let me be clear. Dr. Kane's letter that says, quote, racism is learned at an early age and can be passed on from the one generation to the next is absolutely false. I was raised in Yugoslavia. We didn't have diverse, racially diverse people. No one taught me to be racist. And for 22 years in Queen Anne's County, I have never met a person or a teacher or a law that stops opportunities to anyone based on their skin color. Dr. Kane, I believe you should be ashamed of yourself. Mrs. Oh. Schifanelli. And I believe- the, Mrs. Schifanelli. Yes. As a part of public comment. Yes. We do not have name calling. We do not have direct slurs at anyone in this board. Ms. Harper, I have never addressed anyone with disrespect, but I am addressing this board because you have called me a racist and I'm calling those who support these name callings of my community and parents, shameful name calling. And yet, I am yet to finish with what has been going on with me and my family just because I disagree with being called a racist. Well, that was not from the Board of Education. Well, Ms. Harper, you will be hearing from my attorneys, but yet I'm here to talk about the issue number two. And the issue number two is closings of schools. The issue number two and uh, blocking kids in, and, and putting kids in front of the screen is absolutely, absolutely harmful. American Association of Pediatricians have issued a detailed study how harmful it is to have children staring at the screens, locked up five days a week, six hours a day. Now, as far as I understand, that hasn't happened because children haven't been staring in front of the screen six hours a day in the last three days. But at least 40 members of our community have left public schools and ran for their safety into private schools that have opened either as a hybrid model or as a full-time model. Children are attending schools, children are learning in private schools, and the money is not an issue. It is the creativity and it is the desire to put children before teachers and educators so that they can learn math, science, art, and music. Instead, the focus of this board and this superintendent has been political activism in school. Now, I can tell you as a Maryland practicing attorney that under Maryland local rules, section 1301 through 304, you all are non-political and non-partisan individuals. Any objective appearance of partisanship should be sanctioned immediately. You've been silent all throughout June, July, and August, and now we are in the month of September. So therefore, I demand that this board and Dr. Andrea Kane immediately resigns from this position. Oh, oh, I oh, demand- oh, 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 Ms. President, let me, 
Mrs. In Schifanelli, Mr. 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 Smith. Smith. Everybody, I had to read this statement. I'm going to read it one part in here, and we're going to have to listen to this because we can't have this. Comments about actions or statements of individual staff members are not appropriate for public comment and should be referred to the superintendent of schools or the board president in a letter. If you'd like to do that, but it, we're not, well, I am, we're not going to hear criticism or say, I know your opinions, I respect them, everything you want to say, but there's certain etiquette we're going to have in here. So my opinion is that you failed family members, you failed the community, and you failed the children. You became political instrument of teachers associations and unions, and you are an, a shameful group of people, and I cannot wait for November the 3rd to vote you, vote you all out. Thank you, and have a good day. Maybe, um, maybe we need to go out and say the public you comment. Read, you may read this out there. Maybe you need to go out and tell them all because yeah, they know. all missed it. We know. We know. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you very much for um, allowing uh, all of us to speak. Um, I just kind of wanted to... Record, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry. Helen Bennett. I live at 236 Dominion in Chester. Thank you. And Good evening. Yes, thank you very much. I just wanted to say that I kind of agree with a few of the speakers I've heard, which is that I would like you to rethink um, closing the Queen Anne County Schools. I understand that there were a lot of um, plans that were looked at and were determined to be maybe too expensive, and I am kind of hoping that, I know you can answer questions now, but maybe those plans could be posted or if there's some place where we can access them to just kind of look at them. Um, I know that the survey that went out, there were approximately 70% of the parents who wanted some type of in-person teaching. Um, that's a huge majority, and you guys had, a, as, as I watched on one um, meeting, that is a huge percentage of the um, people who are in our schools. And so I know it's not easy to look outside the box and to do things hard. I mean, just like initially, we weren't going to have anything graduation-wise. It was going to be all virtual. But you all came together um, along with help from the community and came up with this amazing, because um, I saw a lot of them on Facebook, this amazing graduation. So I know that we can do this. I know that working together, because we all know that virtual learning is not for everybody. I mean, they learn that in college. These are college students who can't do virtual learning, let alone our elementary, middle school, and high school. Um, the special needs children, I think, especially are struggling. Um, I know that we know hot spots and internet with our broadband rural areas are struggling. Um, so, and even the finances, I mean, Chromebooks are expensive and they break. I understand the keys pop off. There's just a lot of things that go on with them. And I mean, that adds up to it. And not everybody learns well, not anybody learns the best um, doing a lot of their work online. And, and that's just been proven over and over again. So I would just really encourage you to maybe look at doing in person. It seems as if that is the majority of what they want. And even though it'd be extra work, um, I think that we have the minds and the, and the, and the, commission, the uh, community that can work with you to get this accomplished. And I thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Bennett. Wait till you get done. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Melissa Sybottom. I live at 112 Browning Lane in Centerville, Maryland. I'm here today. Um, I understand the board has a very difficult position with putting our kids in school versus safety and things of that nature. I come to you with two concerns. One, is I have a child with special needs. I yet, I have yet to get information on how he is going to be taught and what accommodations are going to be provided to him under the Americans with Disabilities Act. I've requested repeatedly several pieces. I have received no information. I get cryptic emails back from Ms. Smith that don't address the questions I've asked. I've requested a direct aid be provided to my child in his daycare facility because that has now become his new classroom and schoolroom. He cannot read, he cannot write, yet he's expected to sign into Schoology and Google Meets and be on a computer for six hours a day. He, he can't be on a computer for 15 minutes. 
I've been told that he may enter the school on the 14th or possibly the 17th for one-on-one -on -one instruction for three hours a day on Thursdays and Fridays. That's not acceptable for our special education children. They should have been at the forefront because they are the children that cannot do this. They cannot learn. They cannot do anything individually. I then have a seventh grader who cried today because she didn't understand what was expected of her on this asynchronous day. She was told by one level of educator that she had to check in at 10 minutes before at each period and work with the, the teacher. The teachers are telling her, no, that's not the expectation. She's terrified that she's going to be marked absent and she takes her education very seriously. She's an honors English and math student. We are doing a great disservice to these children by not having them in the classrooms. They need to learn. They need to be with their teachers. They need to be able to have that one-on-one -on -one focus when needed from a teacher, whether special education or regular. Our ch children need that social interaction. I understand that school is not about socialness, but there is that piece that comes with it, that learning of social norms, that learning that we are in a pandemic and maybe sometimes in society, you have to do things you don't like, like wear a mask or not be able to high five your friend, but at least you can see them and you can get that emotional support. These children can't get that. They, they, they're not getting what they need, distance learning. And I know you have a difficult decision, but I implore you, please, put these children back in the classrooms as quickly as possible. I know your plan says possibly after the first quarter, it needs to be before that. And you need to please look at our special education children because the disservice to them is huge. I'm also asking that the board um, go to the state superintendent and request for any child in special education to be advanced in years for their um, the, the life skills program. Right now at 21, the program ends. And because our children have lost so much in learning and it will take time to, to regroup for them, I'm asking that the children be allowed to stay in school for at least an additional one to two years, depending on how long we remain in virtual learning. I do appreciate all the hard work you guys are doing, but I implore you, please, Think about what this is doing to our children and to families. I, my husband and I both work full time. We, 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 can't, we can't educate our children and we're not equipped to do so. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Laura Nickman, 421 Webfoot Lane, Stevensville, Maryland. I hope you're all having a nice evening. Um, as a parent involved with Queen Anne's County Public Schools for the last 20 years, I'm respectfully asking you to perform your elected duties and protect the rights of all children in Queen Anne's County to receive an equal quality academic education that is free from political indoctrination and racial polarization as required by the law. We need your commitment that our public schools are performing, um, are promoting American democracy as required by law, not communist revolution. We need you to protect our children from being infected with racially divisive leftist, leftist theories that distort history and breed new generations of racism. We need you to hold school administrators accountable for providing the necessary academic skills that will empower each child to achieve the American dream. I ask you to preserve the human dignity of each child, of everyone's sons and daughters. The promise of a better America built on equal opportunity through excellence in education. And if we want to make an example out of Queen Anne's County, let's work together to make an example of academic excellence. Thank you.
Good evening. Good evening. I'm allowed to take my mask Sure. Off. <laughs> Alexis Capes, and my address is 3401 Barclay Road, Marydell, Maryland, 21649. Good evening. Um, I am here today to talk about some of the issues that I know not only myself and probably a lot of other parents out there are having. Um, the past three days have been awful. They haven't been getting any better. I have a seven-year-old daughter. Um, she goes to Sellersville, and I have to give our teacher props. She has been trying her best. She has about 18 students in the class, and a typical day for me feels like you know, my daughter has anxiety. She gets frustrated if she doesn't know what's going on. She feels like she's falling behind or if the class is moving too fast. She gets up, runs to the bathroom, is crying, has a nervous stomach. And then once we get back onto the computer, back on track, it's, you know, the same thing. And then watching other kids feel like, you know, they're at the daycare or they're at a babysitter. Babysitter's trying to run around, help you know, eight to 10 other kids that are there. He's on the headset, you know, he's got his head down, he's crying. Next day, same thing, a little girl heads down crying. I mean, the poor teachers, you know, almost in tears trying to figure out how to help these kids. The Schoology isn't working. Some of the stuff she uploads isn't there. Then, you know, I have the school calling me, trying to help me, um, trying to help them. I know it's all a learning experience, but, um, for these elementary school students, I do not feel like this is benefiting them at all. I feel like they are falling behind and I feel like this is just not fair to them and not fair to the parents that are trying to figure out how to teach their children and they don't even know what's going on. So that's it, thank you. Thank you, thanks for that. Hopefully it'll get better. What was that? I'm hoping, we're all hoping that yes. it will get better for everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good evening. Hi, how are you? Um, okay. My name is Chris Blanton. I live at 242 Laysons Hill Court. It's in Churchill. Um, uh, I'm here, obviously, for the same reason that it seems like most people are here for. I worked this morning, and I had to take annual leave to be here tonight. So I want to make sure I reiterate. I worked this morning, and I had to take annual leave to be here tonight. Explain to me how I'm supposed to teach my kid. I'm a parent. I'm a taxpayer. I'm a voter of Queen Anne's County. I'm not an outside influence. I'm a voter of Queen Anne's County, someone that can actually go to the ballot box and vote. The order to keep the schools closed is detrimental to underprivileged students and working class families. Detrimental. I called the school board. It took me forever to get a hold of a person at the school board, only to be hung up on multiple times. Multiple times I was hung up on. I was told by one person I should contact the county commissioners and rudely told to ask for more money. County, school board doesn't need more money. County budget's $144 million. School budget's $61 million, $6 million in debt, directly from the county website. That's 47% of the county budget that the school gets, 47%. The average cost of private school, $12,800 in the state of Maryland. Queen Anne's County cost per pupil $13,500 per person from, from websites. Clearly the, the schools need better fiduciary leadership and not more money. There's not enough Chromebooks to go around and you expect parents to figure it out. I don't have a Chromebook, I can't get a Chromebook. I've talked to many people how to get a Chromebook. How's my kids supposed to do Schoology if they can't get a Chromebook and I'm forced to work around that? Unacceptable. How do you expect working class families working hours throughout the day to teach their kids? I don't think we have an answer to that either. Do you expect a parent to quit their job in order to teach their kids? Because that's what's happening. People are being forced to get out of work to go teach their kids because they have nowhere to send them. There's a reason that the school budget is so massive. It's designed for in-class instruction, not for Schoology, not for laptops, especially elementary school kids. Elementary school kids should not be doing this stuff online. 
I have a child, a six-year-old, that sits on there, and you can see on the screen when they say, if you understand, put your thumbs up. Or, so everyone puts their thumbs up. They understand what the teacher's saying. They don't comprehend what the teacher's saying. So when we try to get back on the computer, we're trying to figure it out as we go along because I have a wife that has to work from home sometimes to try to, to, try to homeschool the best that she can. Some families are struggling to make ends meet. And you know, and, and throw... And, and you throw the stress and financial burden on them to, to take on a new career that they didn't go to school or were not trained to do. There's only two hours of instruction a day visually on the computer, except for Monday, where there's no, vi or except for Wednesday, where there's no visual instruction. A survey was sent out a few months back, I believe by the board. Am I correct on that? Survey was sent out by the board. You guys received 500 back. I think that's what was said. I think that was directly from the school website, or from an email, I'm sorry, an email from the, the Board of Ed or someone within the, within the school. There's 7,800 kids in Queen Anne's County, 7,800. So that's about 6.5% feedback if you go by 500 surveys that made it back to the, to the Board of Ed. Again, the school system is putting an extreme burden on under, underprivileged and working class families. The school board needs to open up and figure out how best to do in-school instruction and stop wasting time. Kids need to go back to school. That's what schools were designed for. Not in-home instruction, not Schoology, not laptops, not Chromebooks. It's, a, it's designed for in-school instruction. These kids need to go back to school, especially the elementary school's kids. They're supposed, you know, we talk about all the time how it's a sponge. Their mind is a sponge at a young age, right? But we're not sending them back to school to learn. We're forcing the parents to try to figure it out. If you have someone that's working one job and they're trying to make ends meet and they have four kids, how do you expect them to teach their kids if they can't get Chromebooks? They can't send their kids to school. Now, I'm not substituting school as a daycare because it's absolutely not. That's why they get 47% of the county budget because we're not substituting. So I like to encourage the schools to open back up. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good evening, my name is Kathy Marinucci. I live at 130 Governor's Way, Queenstown, Maryland, 21658. I am reading a letter for someone else who couldn't be here tonight. This letter was addressed to Dr. Kane. My husband and I, along with a group of local American patriots, have put together an online conversational meeting that we would like to share with all middle and high school students in Queen Anne's County. My husband has been a litigating attorney for over 25 years, has a master's degree from the University of Baltimore in government and public administration. He and several peers are interested in speaking with the students about the true meaning of American patriotism in the United States today. Along with this, they will be discussing the constitutional rights of all Americans. This letter was sent to Dr. Kane and it was denied. So we feel as if Dr. Kane wants to put her race, push her racism agenda in the schools, but does not want to educate the children on patriotism in the United States and their con constitutional rights. This is what was sent as a, um, I don't know who to put this to. Give it to Mr. Pender about the um, virtual class that they, they wanted to instruct. Okay. I thank you very much. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Mrs. Marinucci. Hello. Please state your name Good and evening. address. My name is Paul Couch. My address is 605 DeBall Road. That's in Stevensville, Maryland. 211-21666. Um, I mostly came here because uh, 
and I'm a little older, I know that you, uh, when you have concerns, if you stay home, then you should be quiet because you didn't do anything. So I feel by coming here, um, I'm doing the next right thing. So my, um, my main concern is that I have two children that would be at the Ken Allen High School. Uh, one would be a ninth, one be a, a, a junior. <clears throat> Thank God they have their mother's intelligence and they're doing very well uh, in school. But I have to say when I was their age, uh, I want to be 15 and want to be 17, I, uh, I, besides playing football, and I remember uh, we called them mini bikes and everything, I, I, I don't know, I just don't, I don't know if I would have been paying attention. I don't think I would have been doing my schoolwork. Um, so I, um, I trust with myself working and my wife working, I trust my two boys did well today when I came home. They said they already did their work. Um, I need to be more, um, I need to check it so they're transparent, you know, and, and make sure they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. But, um, I don't understand why, um, our school I guess we closed down in March, and why we weren't prepared to open up uh, if things were all going well. And it sounds like uh, th all things were going well, and then we just got uh, the information that it, it, it was doing uh, well, and we could start back. And then I think it was like, no, and uh, no explanation involved. I guess maybe they weren't ready, you all weren't ready. Um, I don't understand uh, you had six months to say, hey, how about if this is going to get better? So th that, that concerns me quite a bit that um, I coached, I helped coach wrestling last year for the high school. Um, it, was, it was great. And then we had so many plans to go and do things down in Florida as a team and everything last year. And it all got shot down and, and there's nothing going on now. And I think it's not just the schooling. Do you remember, I remember being on the playground and you get to be around other people and you get to do things and associate. And uh, that's not being done now. You're staring into a Chromebook. Um, so I didn't know if I would be speaking, but I, I thought I'd just say what's on my mind. And I wanted to be um, respectable because um, you know, when you go in and you only have complaints, it's not very nice. So, um, but I think we can talk about it without being um, hurtful or hateful. Um, I love our community. I've been over here in Stevensville for 20 years. I, I was in Pasadena and I really enjoyed here. And uh, I have uh, concerns. So the, the, the next thing for me to do is to start getting involved. So hopefully maybe I'll see you all again and uh, it'll be on a good note or at least we can uh, talk and then maybe come to some kind of uh, agreement, maybe, right? God bless, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Couch. Thank you. We have two more folks. Hello. Good evening. Good evening, all. Good evening. Timothy Kingston, Graysonville, Maryland. Good to see a whole bunch of friendly former faces that I haven't seen in a while, and some I have. Um, I haven't been in front of the board in a long time. I actually, I don't think, actually, maybe Tammy and the captain, you might have been here a couple of years ago when I came in front. I'm concerned. Um, I reached out to a couple of you guys a little bit ago. I'd just like to say this, the board sets policy according to what I've read in the Queen Anne's County uh, documents for Board of Education. The superintendent follows that policy. We have a great county. We have great people that work here and live here. We have great teachers 
great school bus drivers. Um, but I'm concerned about the path that we're going down. You know, you as our board members, I have to, oh, there's Dick. Sorry, Dick. Um, you control what happens. You control the path of where the Board of Education is and where it's going, okay? Our superintendent follows your policies. You create the policies, she puts them through. I would just ask that you look at what we have. Um, I don't know about the racism. I haven't seen anything in the uh, school um, or in the sheriff's office. Uh, the teachers I know don't really talk about anything. So I'm concerned when I do hear about racism and we don't have the documentation to show where it is. But I do know this, we have a great community yeah, it's a fantastic community. And we need to go down a path where we don't bring that into our school, where the school system teaches reading, writing, arithmetic. Let the, um, let the political stuff be handled by the parents. The other things handled by the church. You know, let's teach our kids so they can graduate, get good jobs, go to college, and all the other stuff. We don't need the political BS here. So, thank you for serving. I know it's a tough job at times. So, um, for everyone, and thank you for your service, Superintendent. So, that's all. Good night. Thank you, Mr. Kingston. Good evening. Good Thank evening. you for coming. Thank you for having me in what I am sure has been a very long night. <laughs> My name is Raven Bishop. I live at 719 Main Street in Church Hill. Um, I'm here today uh, because it seems like there have been two main threads in the public comment tonight, so I'd like to touch on both. Um, the first is the reopening of schools. I'm just here to voice that I am very happy that Queen Anne's County Public Schools has chosen to put the safety of our children, staff, and faculty first. This is not an easy time we're living in, and this is not an easy thing to do to implement remote learning and to jump through the myriad challenges and bureaucracies that have um, come the way of this board and this county. And so I thank this board and this county and Dr. Kane and the Tiger teams, and most of all, our teachers who are putting in a valiant effort and doing the very best they can by our kids. It's important to note that no one expected this to be normal. This is not the normal. And it's also too early, two days into the school year, three now, to say that our children are falling behind or that things are not working. We haven't given them a chance to work and we don't expect that this is the way it's going to work forever. So I just want to begin by saying thank you for putting safety first always. And I don't know what the right answer is, and I don't envy the decisions that have to be made, but I want to say thank you for safety first and everything else second. The second reason why I'm here tonight is to um, give my strong support to Dr. Kane. Um, when I received communications from her earlier this summer, I was reassured, and um, I was particularly reassured by uh, Dr. Kane's discussion of race and racism and facing the issue of racial unrest that our country finds itself in directly and um, empathetically. And um, I could go on and on, but I think the point is made. I'm also here to say that as a white parent in this school system, that I want my child to have access to communications and to facilitate conversations about race. This was lacking in my education when I grew up in an all white, almost all white school system. And I do not want that to be the case for my child. My child deserves at the minimum 
the opportunity to participate in facilitated conversations about race and racism. Moreover, as a white parent, I want my child to have access to a curriculum that not only celebrates the stories in our country, but also faces hard histories in our country and hard realities that persist to this day. If my child, a second grader, is able to face the hard reality of active shooter drills in his school, then he is more than equipped to handle hard histories and hard realities in our country. I would want my child to have a comprehensive anti-racism curriculum that he has available to him as part of his education in Queen Anne's County Public Schools. You've heard tonight from a number of people that are part of a coordinated effort to speak a different narrative than I am speaking right now in this moment. And I'm here to tell you that there is nothing radical about giving students the opportunity to talk about race and racism in a school building. There is nothing radical about children having the opportunity to listen to one another about their lived experience. And I want my child to learn how to have courageous conversations with people who are experiencing a different experience than him. Finally, there is nothing radical about saying black lives matter. And I would hope that this board would join in many boards across this nation, including Anne Arundel County Public Schools in passing a resolution that not only supports Dr. Kane, I know there has been statements supporting Dr. Kane, but that's a different thing than a resolution, and a resolution that affirms that Black Lives Matter. Um, finally, Dr. Kane, I want to speak directly to you. I said it before, but it bears repeating. Not only do you have my support and my respect, you have our trust. My family stands with you and trusts you to make the right decisions for our child. And you have taught our family and my child the one lesson that I hope he gets as a Queen Anne's County Public School student, that when something is wrong, you stand up and you speak out. And when it gets hard to do that, you don't stop. And I heard you say you won't stop and neither will we. And if my child leaves with nothing else from the school system, that's the lesson that I want him to have. You've become something of a superhero in our family. And I thank you. And I want to say to this board that we are living in a historic time and generations from now, we'll look back at records big and small, not just the ones that happened down in Washington, D.C., but in small little school systems like ours. And the record will show the decisions that were made. And me and my family, we stand on the right side of history with you, Dr. Kane. And I would hope that this board would, too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Special. you. Okay, that's the end of public comment. Mr. Pender, that is the end? Okay, thank you so much. We are now at presentations, 5.01 QACPS recovery and reopening plan updates. Thank you, and as Mr. P comes forward, we'll share uh, some information with regard to the recovery and reopening plan. But let me just say before Mr. P even starts to talk that in light of the two things I wanna say. One is the newspaper is still running my letter from August 28th, right? So when you see the school district, Dr. Chet Kane isn't changing despite the governor's that's not with regard to what the governor said yesterday. That's in response to my letter that I wrote over the weekend on August 28th, and most parents received it on August 29th. That is not a response to the governor's press conference on yesterday, September 1st. So let me make that clear. Uh, and the second thing that I wanna say is that my team, we, we, we've been doing, Mr. P and I told you today how we've been doing school visits, and so we have not had an opportunity to meet to talk about the changes that we need to make with our recovery plan in light of the governor's press conference on 
on yesterday. On yesterday, the governor said schools could come back for 50% capacity. We've got some questions. You know, we want to make sure that that has to do with transportation and all those kinds of things. But you know that in our recovery plan, we have a hybrid model that does an A-B schedule. Uh, then we got some information from the state superintendent that talks about three and a half hours of instruction five days a week. So there's some work that we need to do. Um, and that is not reflective in the um, presentation that you will see tonight. My team still needs to meet. It's about 24 hours, uh, just a little over 24 hours since the governor made his announcement yesterday. We've not had an opportunity to meet. Um, and like I said in my letter over the weekend, things change quickly. We are just in that type of environment. We've had multiple changes over the past five to seven days, and we want to be sure that we are thorough in our response. And so we didn't quickly pull together something that, you know, we haven't had a chance to check out. So you're going to hear some updates tonight, um, but know that you will get yet another update and, of course, another communication with from me that talks about what we'll do in terms of in light of the governor's press conference on yesterday. So with that, we'll start with our uh, recovery plan. And of course, we are here to provide those updates um, for you. We have not, keep scrolling, you have not, um, we've not changed the organization of our plan. You know the three phases, planning and organizing, implementing and supporting, and evaluating and adjusting. And of course, we are in that third phase, evaluating and making adjustments. Um, we do have the 13 components of our recovery and reopening plan, which have not changed. We've gone over those before, so we're not going to go over them again. Our recovery plan is posted on our website, so we do have a link in this PowerPoint so that um, everyone can easily access it, but it is on the first pa front page of the website for anybody who is interested. Um, with that, uh, reopening updates. We'll go ahead and um, Mr. P, Mr. Paluski, um, please go right ahead. Thank you, Dr. Kane. Uh, for the record, Greg Paluski, Deputy Superintendent, uh, and I think Dr. Kane's intro is uh, is is at the state of where we are. I think everybody has monitored that there has been some significant changes in the last two weeks and more significantly the last 24 hours. Uh, so Dr. Kane is exactly the point of where we are, which is we want to make sure that we're thorough. We want to make sure that we're understanding the direction um, from the State Department down to the locals. And you'll see a little bit of that today as we begin to make uh, some recommendations as we move forward. The biggest, which happened on August 27th, is the COVID-19 guidelines for Maryland schools. And if you click on that, and there's a, there's a subset to that and Mrs. Morissette probably knows that better than any of us, as it monitors COVID cases across the state, specifically by jurisdiction. And one of the things that superintendents had been uh, advocating for are a set of health metrics and guidelines and benchmarks that are related to positivity rates. And this is in response to that. So, um, which is great, which is exactly what I think superintendents had been asking for. So that is new information that we have not had before that we're able to use as we make some decisions. And I wanna go back to what Dr. Kane mentioned about our process. And we've always said this from the beginning, and that is we will constantly evaluate, um, we will take in new information, and we will readjust that, readjust our recovery or opening plan based upon relevant and new information at any time that we get in order to make the best decision for our students. Uh, so with that, our district recovery plan, as you know, it was uh, posted uh, as required by MSDE on uh, August the 14th. That is currently under review, has been under review. You saw, probably saw the state uh, board of education meeting that summarized uh, all 24 jurisdictions and their plans. Uh, right now, they are uh, evaluating those and giving us focused feedback to every assistant superintendent based upon the criteria. And you know that some of that criteria has changed even within the past couple of days. So we're anxious for that feedback. Number one, we'll use that feedback to adjust and improve. So that's where we are as the recovery plan and, and some changes that we're going to want to make. Um, as the superintendent has also uh, reiterated about our school calendar, you know, we did start this week 
uh, and it's posted there on the 31st as well as uh, yesterday uh, for all of our students. So we are, have been officially open this week, open for business. And uh, as you can even hear from some of our student uh, board members today, that we're off to a good start, even though we've got a lot of work to do as we move forward. Uh, and pre-kindergarten, which, we'll, which had started today. Uh, superintendent's letter indicated, again, that bringing in small groups by September 14th, again, that might be readjusted now that we've gotten some new information that we know we're in stage three uh, of the recovery plan. With that said, and even the newest information which came out this week from the Maryland State Board of Education, and we just want to reiterate that to the public. Again, schools have to be open for students in 180 days. That's no different than has it been in the past. Uh, must include six hours uh, of instruction per day. And as Dr. Kane mentioned, the 3.5 hours of synchronous uh, instruction has to be spread out over the day. Again, I think many of us certainly at my level have asked for information like this in September in uh, June. And although just getting this now to reiterate the superintendent's direction, we know we've got to go back and we've got to look at our schedules based upon new information from MSDE. Again, the pre-K, uh, the 1.5 hours, uh, again, MSDE working with our local superintendents to provide. Now, again, this was of September 1st that the implementation of that minimum requirement uh, would be at the end of the calendar year. That is the minimum. And again, which does not pertain to us, which is the last bullet. As you know, there were some jurisdictions that were called out during the press conference that did not have plans in place to be able to bring, um, although I believe they all, all of us had to have plans. Um, we are certainly, as you know, we have been planning for uh, small groups um, since May. Um, so we feel pretty good about that. One of the biggest things that we've implemented this year, and you've heard, certainly have heard that, uh, is our Schoology Learning Management System, something that we've wanted to do now for the last uh, five years that I've been here. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, my two colleagues, um, uh, Mrs. Julie Forbes, who is the uh, Supervisor of Accountability research testing and uh, Mr. Page, they have been our two uh, point of contacts, our project leaders, as you will, on all things Schoology. So uh, they're gonna share with you kind of where we've been, where we are, and uh, they can talk about the Schoology platform inside out nine ways come Sunday. So I thank both of them for their leadership in uh, implementing such an important initiative. Good evening. Thank you for coming tonight. I know you guys have been working very hard on this and we really appreciate everything. Great. Thank you. Uh, so good evening, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Julie Forbes. I'm the Supervisor of Accountability Assessment and Data Management. Good evening. Michael Page. I'm the Supervisor of Science, Physical Education, Health, and Environmental Literacy. And so as Mr. Paluski shared, we're just going to share a quick update. We know Mr. Paluski has been continuing to share updates on Schoology, the learning management system that we are implementing for the 2020-2021 school year. And so just to catch you up to what we've been doing. So um, we held our teacher and staff training the week of August 24th through the 27th. And every teacher, our staff were trained in Schoology by a Schoology trainer. And we also at the sites had a separate training on the Google integration. So the Google Drive and Google assignments are a big part of the learning management system of part of Schoology. And really the emphasis has been for our staff to start with the basics, the fundamentals of the system and make sure that we have everyone trained and comfortable to deliver instruction. And as the year progresses, we'll start to use some of those more advanced functionalities. Of course, we have staff who um, are quite proficient in technology and they are welcome um, to use some of those advanced features if they'd like at this time. But as a district, we're really rolling things out intentionally to make sure that people are able to build that base foundation of knowledge um, before we proceed to that, again, advanced functionality because there's just a lot the system can do. Um, so following the week of training, um, again, all of our staff were trained, we've been just sharing weekly updates. So every school has a Schoology teacher leader. Our elementary and middle schools have one uh, teacher on staff who serves in that role. Our high schools have two. And so we've been sharing just weekly updates as issues arise, as questions arise, to push out information which is then shared with staff. So that's really been our main communication process is going through those teacher leaders. We've also been meeting with them on a regular basis. 
We developed some web page resources on our QACPS site, and so parents can navigate to a new parent web page, and we also have one for students. And I'll just give you a very quick view of what those look like. Let's see, I'll just bring it up this way. So if you just navigate to our website, for parents, you go to the Parents tab, right down to Schoology. And we have just some very quick resources in both English and Spanish that some videos, some walkthrough documents similar on the student page that just really show you how to create that account, how to use that parent access code, which we'll talk about in just a minute, and really how to um, start using that as a parent or a caregiver. And similarly, we also have one set up for students. So again, under the students tab, just jump to Schoology. And again, very similar, a few of the videos that are really geared towards the age of the students, elementary and secondary, some help articles. So we push those out. And then, of course, one of our biggest pieces of communication was that we, last week on August 28th, sent out the welcome letters. So it was the second letter that parents have received. And this one included the instructions for signing up for a parent account. And they received a, se a separate secure email that contained the parent access code for their child. So it's a very easy, streamlined process for parents that they create an account on their own. They share the information and create an account in Schoology. They enter the access code, which is unique to their child. The child's automatically linked to their account, and they can have that parent view. And we've received really positive feedback on that so far from our parent community that it's a pretty easy, streamlined process. Um, and similarly, students received a letter on how to access Schoology, and the students access Schoology by using their Google accounts. So similar to how they log into other systems, they use that Google account, and they're able to get into their student accounts, and they've been able to interact with all of their courses. And we have our system set up, so there's an automatic sync with the courses they're enrolled in, so they see everything um, for their classes and their teachers. And lastly, we're just continuing to provide ongoing training for our teachers and staff and led by the Schoology teacher leaders. So Mr. Page and I will continue to provide training this year to those teacher leaders who will help uh, push that out at their sites. And, and a lot of that training agenda is going to be, you know, based on things that are further down on our roadmap, but also as needs arise and interests, um, things that are unique to our county so that we can support our, our schools, student staff, and parents. So there are two additional updates that we wanted to update the board on, and one was video conferencing software and the other was external tools. Um, the video conferencing software, we evaluated several different um, providers for that. We looked at the big blue button, which is the tool that is utilized within Schoology. Um, we looked at Google Meet and we looked at some others. Um, one of the big ones is the big blue button within Schoology. We found that was uh, had some limitations in terms of the timeline that the information was saved. So it only saves for about seven days and then it's automatically deleted. We also found some issues within that platform, the big blue button, that, um, uh, that it only uh, recorded for about 10 minutes. And um, this was also a very expensive in order to upgrade to their to their enterprise software. So um, we w stuck with Google Meets at this point, um, and uh, we are utilizing Google Meet for our, uh, our video conferencing software. This is something that our teachers were familiar with last year and utilized last year, so we're very comfortable with that, and we look forward to improving that uh, in the coming months. Uh, just wanted to update you on a few things in terms of also video video conferencing and some and some guidelines. We issued out guidelines to all our staff, student, and parents. Some of those guidelines are as written here, where we uh, video and audio recordings of live syn synchronous instruction, including string shots, will be prohibited by students and parents in the 2021 school year due to the protection of the student privacy and proactively preventing cyberbullying. One of the other provisions that we had in our guidelines is teachers are permitted to record themselves and use instructional videos for the use during synchronous and asynchronous instruction, but they have to exclude the student image and the student audio. And that is due to privacy of our, our students in FERPA. We're trying to follow those guidelines there. The external tools, we had some inquiries in terms of that and uh, the interportability between some of our curriculum software and curriculum resources that we have. 
Uh, our focus right now, our main focus is getting students, getting teachers, and getting families up and running in Schoology. Uh, and we have a Schoology roadmap for our implementation, and on our roadmap are the external tools. Uh, this, would, this allows for our, uh, our tools to quickly integrate within the platform, but we still are utilizing some of the techniques that we used last year in terms of having our students utilize the single sign-ons. Uh, so again, in terms of the external tools, each internal, uh, external tool has a different way of functioning and communicating, so there's, there's uh, some background that really, background um, uh, that we have to do with uh, getting all of those systems to talk and it does it is very time consuming So each one is unique and it's going to take us a little bit of time to get those up and running So we anticipating beginning that in the late September and and pushing those out uh, to our teachers as we continue I don't understand what you just said about external tools. What are you talking about? So I can give you an example with science. So we have a platform in which our science instruction takes place in. So we've purchased a tool in the past that allows students to go there and they have their, a lot of their resources for science within there. So they, they go to that, they've gone to that in the past to do their science work, right? What we can do with Schoology is we can actually have them communicate with each other so that they do all of the work within Schoology instead of having to go to that separate platform. So you are, it's arranged so that you can tap into it and it comes into Schoology? Yes, essentially. So we're bringing that system into Schoology so they continue to stay in Schoology and that was one of our goals as a, with this platform is to try to keep our students within one, one uh, platform. Okay. So you're saying that the, it's taking time to integrate it. So is this going to be detrimental to our students? They're not going to be able to access everything? No, they're still able to access everything the same way that they did in the past. It, 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 it just makes it a little bit more streamlined. Because I, I'm looking There's at the no, letter you sent out to the teachers just because I didn't understand what the big blue button was and, and what the tools were. And I, I'm, I'm glad that you're bringing all this up. Um, and it also says some platform forms weren't approved by us, so it's just because of privacy issues. Yeah. So um, the Schoology integrates with over 200 platforms, but what the integration basically does is it pushes student information to that other platform. So you need to make sure just as a system that we've vetted that other tool, that we have a data sharing agreement in place saying, hey, if you take our data, you're gonna protect it and you're gonna follow the things that we as a county need you to do with it. Um, and so that's one of the big pieces that we need to make sure we do ahead of time. Because once we, so Schoology basically says, hey, we'll integrate, but we're assuming that you're doing your due diligence as a school system and following all the steps of that other vendor. So we need to make sure a data sharing agreement is in place. It's someone that we've vetted, you know, as a county and as a school district saying, hey, this is a system we want to connect to and that we feel safe with our student data being used in that way. Yeah, so they're putting the onus back on us to make sure that yes. they're safe. Okay. Yeah. All right. That makes more sense. Thank you so much. But that's a, there's a delay. You're making that happen, but it's just taking a while. Because okay. mm -hmm. that was the concern that we can't yes. do it right away. So. Yes. Yeah. Is there a hotline with a human being answering it that a parent who gets into a maze of which button to push and so forth can call and get some form of assistance? And we heard some of that, uh, very little of that, but uh, it seemed like a valid point. Uh, is there somebody, or a, some, I, I don't want somebody sitting around doing nothing, and I have a feeling they're going to have just the opposite problem. <laughs> Do you want me to address that? Yeah, go ahead. Sure. So there's a few ways parents can receive support. So they are calling the schools, and typically the schools are addressing it through the main office or the Schoology teacher leader. Oftentimes they're then funneling questions to us at the Board of Ed. So in the accountability office, um, we have three of our staff who are dedicated one to each level, so in elementary, middle, and high, who are supporting those schools to get the answers quickly to then bring it back to the parent. Are we sure that that system is oiled and working well? 
From the feedback we've received, yes, because we're receiving those questions. And you know, occasionally I receive a parent call and email, and of course we get right back to our parents as well. So we just want them to feel comfortable with the system. That's the most important thing at the end of the day. But if anyone's struggling, they're always, my email's up at the end of the presentation. You're welcome to reach out, so. Are you comfortable that all the sophisticated applications, software have been acquired and you're using to simplify this process? Is there anything that didn't get bought uh, that would make life easier for everybody? The answer, yes, no. I mean, I'm sure, I, I'm not suggesting you go looking for something. <laughs> but I mean, uh, I just wanna make sure that everything that we want Schoolology to have exists and it works. And the other side is to have a human being giving good instruction to parents who probably are not as sophisticated in dealing with computers as their kids. Mm -hmm. that, you know, I got a phone, I had to get my grandchildren to figure out how to make it work. Um, there's generation gaps. Mm -hmm. And you say yes. It, are, is this process communicated? So uh, every parent that has uh, involvement with schoolology says if you have a problem, uh, reach this person uh, in your school uh, and if that person can't deal with this uh, they will refer you immediately to someone who can help yeah a lot of the parents are actually starting with the classroom teachers as well you know letting them know if they had any we kind need, of difficulty yeah, with their we need accounts. to have everything in place that we can think of to reduce the anxiety of uh, of people doing something different. Nobody wants to, you know, some people thrive on doing different things. Other people, uh, not so much. So we need to help all. Mm -hmm. We agree. Okay. And, and as we're finding- and You, you want to raise your hand and swear that's <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, currently- Cross your heart. No. Yeah, currently, um, our parents are reaching out to teachers, they're reaching out to the main office. The teachers, if they can't answer the question, are going to those Schoology teacher leaders, when they can't answer that question, they're reaching out to us and we are getting responses to them, I would say honestly within sometimes minutes, sometimes hours, certainly within 24 hours. So we're trying to turn it around as quickly as we can. When we find trends in the issue, so for example, if we start hearing about the same issue a few times, we start pushing those out in updates to the whole system um, so that the system has that information to also support parents. Because like you said, there's, it's such a big learning curve, you know, and it's very new for everyone. So we want people to feel supported with that and comfortable asking those questions. Ms. Morissette, do you have any questions? I only have one. I've been getting texts and phone calls and while I'm at work asking why through Schoology my child's being asked to go to this Google site which was approved before but now my device blocks it because Schoology is supposed to be used. And I don't know if you've heard that but I've gotten several throughout the day. <laughs> I don't know how to answer them. I refer them back to their school. Yeah, if you if you are able to send us a little um, a little more information about which system it is, we can work with the technology department to, to get some more information out and figure out what's going on for folks. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Smith, one question I would have along the response. Certainly, you try to get back as quick as you can, but a lot of parents are working nine to five. Mm -hmm. Parent gets home, the students had a problem. Is there any support? Do we have staggered hours for some of our people that they can answer questions, let's say from six to eight, not 24 hours a day, I understand that. But you know, parents get home, they have dinner, they're going over some things, they have some questions. Do they have to wait to the next day or is there any way they can get some kind of support, not in depth, but just something, it could be a minor thing just to get them in the right place, I would think, because by eight o'clock, most people are gonna be done. But you know, six to eight might be a good time to have some kind of support available if possible. I don't know if that would work or not. You know, the Schoology has a lot of great resources, and just to be really transparent, I can tell you the last few weeks, I think we've all probably been answering our emails at all hours of the day and night and weekends. Um, so I think we've been as quickly as we can responding to things, even if it's not during the traditional workday, um, just to make sure teachers have the information they need, parents, students, because um, I know I, I check it constantly, um, especially given that we're in the midst of a new implementation this weekend. Um, you know, we sent out parent and student codes on Friday afternoon. So 
Um, it's not necessarily a direct hotline, but I can tell you that just as a staff member, I know I've been monitoring it and responding. Um, and, and I know a lot of our incredibly hardworking staff at the schools, even though they don't have to, ha have been doing the same thing to support and, their and, you families. Know, in, in that question, mm -hmm. some people go beyond a call of duty. They do. And a lot of them do. But it's not fair to them to have to do that all the time. That's why I'm wondering if we could, if we, if we had enough staff that wasn't doing something or could just swing a time so people like you don't have to do it all the time because at some point you're going to burn out you're going to just, just you know you can only do so much and I they just, are they are burnout. out but know, we but don't have that we we don't have there's no extra staff there's no everybody wears and you heard it three and four hats and they do so what i would suggest is that if parents are you know, if it's after hours, send an email mm -hmm. and the email will be responded to. So if they send it to the school or if they send it to, and we've given the parents um, the letters that show them what to do, if they want to send an email, then they certainly can do that. And we still monitor the emails. There's no hotline number. Uh, I wish we had something like that, Mr. Um, Smith. And if the board, if it, they so desire that we hire someone um, for a hotline number, I'm happy to facilitate I'm, that. I'm not looking at hiring somebody what i'm looking at is said like flex hours if somebody's working from eight to four could somebody else work maybe from two to six or two to eight just you know swing some times where we have if we have the ability to do that some different coverages just you know so somebody doesn't get burnt out somebody's already burnt out Understand and that. But we, we, all... we, we need them during the day as well i i you know it's but, but a, it's but a pay, but parents catch 22. Are working eight to ten hours so, a day and then coming home trying to solve this issue and it's frustrating to a lot of parents sure and and providers that you know they're doing their job plus their teaching job and they're doing it for their kids so they they are they are so and that, that so is our staff. On both. and so they should send an email and we will respond to it ASAP. It has not been an issue, the response time. So I don't want to make an issue out of something that's not an issue. So I would say send an email and we will jump right on it as soon as possible. Gotcha. Is this because we adopted Schoology? Because for heaven's sakes, uh, we, we've been on a virtual uh, teaching for what, six months and we didn't hear these complaints before. Maybe it's because, for whatever reason, um, we did know that some of the teachers needed some skills. And we trained some of the, I think it was three teachers, to teach virtual uh, learning. At least that's what I understand. And so there's internal uh, help. Uh, now we're learning, we might have to set up something uh, to assist others, although I wonder with some of the people why they didn't call in the past six months, why they're calling now. Because we have a new platform, sir. I, that's the, that was the beginning of my question. Yes. Uh, is the platform so different? Uh, like, for instance, somebody said the access, uh, you had to get out of something that you used to be able to stay in and go. In order to schoolology, you had, oop, you had to get out of your email and so forth and go to a, a different place. I, you know, if I sound like I don't know what I'm talking about, you would be correct. But I'm just trying to represent what I think is being said. And it's up to you, which has the brain trust, to figure out how to solve a problem I'm poorly describing. I think you have. Good so, luck. Yeah, Kathy Kelly. I, I, and sort of in line with what he said, I, but our student members back here, they reflected that it's all going good and, and bless their hearts, they're good at this sort of thing. Not the feedback I'm getting. The kids are, they are in tears. Really good students are in tears because of this system. And these are high school kids and they're worried that their grades are gonna hurt for it. So I just wanna give you that feedback. Um, it, you know, it could be on an individual basis. These are smart. These are a couple of smart, really smart kids. Um, so they're having a hard time. And so the question is, you're talking about video, say video conferencing using Google Meet. So they're like, wow, thank goodness we're into, still into Google on something. Because the question for the, that I'm getting from high school seniors right now is, 
and, and we can't go back on it, but why did we incorporate that? They're having a hard enough time doing virtual, and yet they're also having to simultaneously new, learn a new system, as were the teachers. So I don't think it's going so good, but all I'm asking, I mean, we can't pull out of it now, we put a lot of money into it and all, but all I'm asking is, in, when working with the administrators, we need to think about not holding the kids accountable for grades until they they understand this system because they are freaking out and I don't need high school seniors to be having mental problems because of this and it's only been three days so I just want to fill you in it's not as easy as some think and of course we had a person speak here and it's impossible for these elementary kids so I'm not sure about, I'm not giving you a solution, I'm giving you a problem. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, and, just and wanted to share that feedback. And there might be in the future um, an opportunity for us to do with a, a student account that's created for privacy purposes, but really showing you what the system looks like um, and, and for the public as well, because I think that when you see the system, um, we, you know, as we spoke about um, earlier in the implementation, that it was really a solution based on the feedback we received from families and students last spring about some of the frustrations that were coming up with the virtual learning experience at that time. So we started reaching out to teachers, to administrators, parents, and, and started showing them Schoology and said, do you see this as a solution? Because if only we felt our staff and our parents felt comfortable with that, would we proceed? And the feedback we received was so positive that we did proceed in that direction. I think with any new system, there's going to be a learning curve and there's gonna be that initial implementation. It is hard to learn new systems in the midst of already a very different experience for so many of us with virtual learning. Um, Schoology is a system that's used across the country. And again, I think it might help to at some point, you know, in the appropriate setting to just show um, like really what it looks like. We put some conventions in place that make it an easier visual experience for students to know where to go labeled with a day of the week um, to try to help with some of those things. But, you know, we're certainly open to feedback to help make that experience. But we think part of it is going to be some time to learn the new learn the new system and feel comfortable with it for, for everyone. Maybe an explanation of the why should be given at least to the high school kids so they understand why. Right. Um, I've yeah. just got them all going, well, the ones I talk to, they're, they're super upset. Like, why did you guys do this to us? We were having a hard time just doing virtual. Now we gotta learn a whole new system. So um, maybe they just need to understand why we, we made that transition. You know, I wasn't smart. I learned about it, we voted for it, and I mean, I didn't know a lot about it, I just you know, had trust in you guys that it was the right thing to do, but this, some of the students don't understand why. Yeah, and maybe we can partner with our high school, with our high schools and our teacher leaders and our administrators to help provide some support in that way, if, if it sounds like they need it. Because I'm more worried about their mental stability than their grades, mm -hmm. but there needs to be an understanding for them that there is gonna be delay on getting grades until they understand what's going mm -hmm. on. I don't think it's fair to, to hit them up, especially when they're type that care about their grades. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I just want to make sure that, um, it is integrating with the school meet, the Google Meets, which what we had before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so and we're having any issues. Uh, yep, you just post a link. So what the teachers okay. have been doing, um, I was actually just supporting one of our schools with this this morning. So they post a link um, and the students just go straight to that link. Okay, mm -hmm. that's what I, that was something that I had one of the parents say to me that it wasn't, they were having problems getting into Google Meets. So again, I think it's just a matter of, of having a little, you know, visual time to see how it works. Just give everybody a chance to give it a chance. Yeah. All right, that's it. Thank you so very Appreciate much, Mr. Mr. Page and Ms. Forbes. Thank you. Awesome. As soon as we get through this. Awesome. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, sir. Oh. So the next thing on here, sir, is the 2021 policy. Well, we, yeah, we, it's yep, still we'll do that. that. Uh, Captain Kelly just wanted to say June 17th was the PowerPoint presentation that those two individuals did. So that also includes the summary of the results from teachers uh, and parents as it relates to Schoology. And I think Ms. Forbes did a great job of articulating the why, 
um, I just wanted to reference that as, as, as a resource. Um, part of our uh, policy development, Ms. Harper asked uh, about this at I believe our last work session. So by the policy, uh, one of the things that the superintendent has to do is to, uh, to present uh, to the board a calendar, uh, a robust calendar at that uh, for policy and regulation development. And the reason that we included this as part of our recovery uh, updates is the fact that we recognize that we don't have some policies that we need. Uh, we know number one, and, and I think it speaks to you know the the superintendent's vision. We have to have by Comar. We have to have an equity policy, and I think it couldn't happen at a, at a better time. We know we've got to have that in December. The acceptable use policy. I'm only going to highlight three of these. You just listen to about video conferencing to be able to prep students and teachers. We know that new language has to get into the acceptable use policy. We've been doing remote work. Um, for a while, we do not have a policy. We have regu we have some guidelines, but we do need a policy. So we try to prioritize those as it relates to some of the work and challenges that we've faced, as well as a whole other list that encompass not only divisions of curriculum instruction, there's finance, there's operations as well. Uh, Mr. Tully is going to take that on. He's going to be the lead of that. Miss. Um, uh, uh, Andrews, excuse me, uh, she'll be sending out a meeting notice uh, towards later this month to be able to uh, begin the process of our policy committee. And I would just ask Ms. Harper if uh, who you want to be on that committee, that continues to be you. We'll make sure that you're included in that. I'm not going to go over all these, but I, it is uh, directed by the, it was directed by the superintendent that we uh, showcase what we're going to try to tackle in, in this upcoming school year. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Mr. Sid Pinder, to talk about uh, operations and logistics. Thank you, Mr. Poliski. For the record, uh, my name is Sid Pender, uh, Chief Operating Officer. Um, good evening, President Harper, um, Dr. Kane, board members. One of the areas that uh, we wanted to discuss and kind of go over was the um, HVAC protocols, because so there have been some questions about with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, you know, what are we doing to ensure the safety of students and um, staff inside of the buildings? And, we are currently following the uh, ASHRAE and CDC guidelines. The ASHRAE is American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, Air Conditioning Engineers. They are basically the leading authority um, when it comes to air quality and HVAC. Um, Mr. Jim O'Donnell uh, and his maintenance department staff have uh, done a really good job of already implementing some of these before we even came into the COVID-19 um, pandemic. With that being said, what we want to do is we want to um, maximize the ventilation of the school. And if you think real quickly about your house, your house, you're actually breathing the same air over and over and over and over again. With a school, we're always bringing in outside makeup air um, so that we're kind of flushing out the bad air and bringing in the good air. And what we've done, we um, have already done, I should say, um, two hours prior to the start of occupancy of the school, we begin bringing in outside air. Um, ASHRAE recommended 15 to 20%. We've actually doubled that amount um, when they came out with their COVID-19 regulations. Um, some of it we're actually able to get up to around 100% with ERVs. Um, and then when the school day is over, we then kind of, if you want to say, flush the system out again and let the HVAC run at maximum capacity, exchanging the outside air and the inside air. Um, now keep in mind, if it's humid as heck outside, and you're bringing in that outside air, all that air has to be tempered and brought back and the humidity wrung out of it. So it, it does put a little bit of stress on the system, but we are, um, that is the highest recommendation that um, ASHRAE and the CDC guidelines have. The uh, second aspect of it is basically the filtration protocols. And for your minimum efficiency reporting value, which are your MERV filters you'll hear about, um, the CDC and ASHRAE recommend getting to the highest level you can get. And you're gonna hear some people say, oh, well, you should have MERV level 13 in there, all right? MERV level 13 is for systems that are currently, are just being installed. You have to go and look at the rated capacity of what the MERV rating could be for that system. So when you put in there, we're running about nine, 10 MERV um, for our filters. You start going a little higher than that, you're really going to uh, hinder your equipment because the airflow is not going to be coming across um, the coils and everything like that. Um, so with that being said, you know, we're constantly 
analyzing, looking at it, bringing in as much outside air as we can. Meal service. As Dr. Kane said earlier, and she said quite a few times, things change by the minute and guidelines and protocols change by the minute also. Um, MSDE just had a conference call that I was on with Ms. Uh, Margaret Ellen Kalvinovich earlier um, at three o'clock. And basically you have um, two types of meal service programs. You have the summer meal service program and you have the national school lunch breakfast program. Um, when a school was in regular, regular session pre-COVID, um, we follow the strict guidelines of the national school lunch and breakfast program. And that's where, you know, you have to give your name, you have to have the student ID number, those types of things. The USDA, M MSDE, said all summer long, we're going by the national school lunch breakfast program. Just yesterday, USDA came out and said, hey, we're going to waive that and we wanna do the summer meal, meal service program, which is what we've been doing since March 16th, 18th. Um, MSDE said today, hold on a minute, USDA said you can run this until December 30th. We're gonna say for right now, you can run it till September, I'm uh, sorry, did I say December 30th? You can run it to September 30th. So USDA said December 30th, MSDE said, hey, we're gonna take it basically a month by month and see what happens. And that's for the whole entire state of Maryland, not just Queen Anne's County. But I will say this, by having at least that month, it frees us up to do so many more things for the students and make sure that they get meals. Um, we don't have to take the ID number. Um, we don't, if a parent comes up or guardian or neighbor, they can provide, uh, get the meals for the students. So what we're gonna provide, we're gonna provide um, the uh, curbside pickup for students that are strictly virtual. And then we're also, for the students that are coming in for the small group instruction, we're gonna have a grab and go. So this, like I said, will free us up to provide more meals for the students um, and operate at every school, but also have the distribution sites at the five different schools. I'm, I'm hoping that MSD comes along and says, hey, we can extend this for a little bit longer, but this was really good news to hear today that we can at least do it for one more month. Um, I just would also like to say, you know, we served about um, 23,000 meals this summer. And when we had the uh, shutdown back in March until about June 16th, we served almost 164,000 meals. Um, and we know that there's areas that we still need to improve upon. Um, so we're, we're constantly looking at that to change our ways and our different strategies to be implemented. For the reopening, transportation, um, is always a hot topic and as always, you know, we're looking at how we can get the maximum amount of students into the school for small group instructions. Um, each school has turned in their uh, requirement um, for students to attend. And again, you're bringing them in in small phases. Um, next Monday, we have uh, Sellersville Elementary School that will begin bringing in students. And then on the 14th, all of the other schools will be bringing in students as well. What do you mean by all the other schools? The other uh, elementary school, elementary, middle, and high school. So we'll have yeah. small group instruction. Okay. All right. What about the special needs people? So within that small groups are special needs, ELLs, um, students that might be struggling a little bit or that simply have no access to internet. Um, so. I foresee those numbers as you can, everybody else, as long as you've been watching the news, those numbers increasing. You know, at this point, it's still 10 to 12 kids on a bus. Um, you know, hopefully that changes, but right now it's still 10 to 12. We have first tier, which for the most part starts at 7.30, it will run to 11. Then we have the second tier that will run from basically 8.30 to 12. All right, utilizing our buses. Some of the buses we have are over capacity. If you imagine just 10 students, we've rearranged routes to pick those students up to bring them in. That's Monday, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. On Wednesdays, we have four different sessions of CTE students that are coming in um, to minimize the amount of students that are in the building at one time. So we have four different routes uh, that are picking up students from across the county, bringing them to um, Ken Island, I'm sorry, Queen Anne's County High School. 
And then we also have the special education routes um, that we still maintain and we still bring to the different schools throughout the county. We are transporting the two schools outside of the county right now that did reopen. Um, and the, also the other population not to forget about is, is the homeless population that uh, we're still required to pick up and transport. Um, so the buses will be rolling um, and I'm foreseeing most of our buses being filled to capacity until the CDC guidelines change of allowing more students on the bus. So your, oh. your translation is that the cost of what you're doing is the same as it would be if we were running nor normally. It's, it's going to be very close to that, Mr. Anderson. Yes, sir. Okay. I mean, it's, we have, Mar Ms. Margaret Ellen and her staff, um, along with the LLCs and our county drivers, have sat down and just gone over route after route after route. And keep in mind, as when they're coming in on certain particular days, you know, it may be for a special program. So we got to sit there and take a look at it and go, okay, this student needs to come in on this day. All of a sudden we got 12 students on this bus. Whoops, it's not gonna work that way. And then we got to juggle changing that all around. Um, but I'm, I'm confident in what we have in place. Um, you know, will there be some hiccups the first couple of days? Sure, there may be. But, uh, you know, I think by taking it a little by little, we'll be pretty successful with that. Any other questions? I have some yeah. questions. Yes, ma'am. So not all your small groups, not all of these students are going to be coming by bus. Some will be dropped off, some will be driving. That's correct. Okay. Those who are coming by bus, are they being screened before they step on the bus? No. They, uh, the regulations that they have in place now, the students come to school and that's when they go through the, the screening process. Um, they are required to wear a mask as well as the bus driver is required to wear a mask, um, but they're not screened once they get on the bus. Uh, quite frankly, I don't really know how you could do it without having extra people on the bus, because you imagine sitting on 213, stopping, and then all of a sudden you turn on the lights, um, you know, and you're there for a couple more, you know, seconds. Um, you know, basically the consent form, I'm not allowing my child to come to school if they, you know, um, having these types of symptoms and things like that is is how uh, our nursing supervisor recommended okay the logistics I agree it's going to mm -hmm. be difficult the problem I see is you're going to have children who will be sent who aren't displaying typical symptoms but may have a fever when they get to school now they're screened and they're going to be turned back around and no one's home to come get them but now you've already had the child on a school bus and now sitting in the school, in an office, now exposing other people. Those are just concerns okay. I have. Sure. No, I can take them back, and then we can talk about them. That's. Thank you. The bus is also infected. Well, we can. You've got the social time, distancing, yeah. but you know, you know it's going to happen. <laughs> I, I, no, I got. It. I, I understand. Any other questions, Ms. Morissette? That was it. The buses were the big concern. Sure. And we can sit down. Well, I, you hear this air filtration. We turn our air over in our schools a lot more than like a residential property or most oh, businesses. Yes. So when we talk about a MERV 12 or 14, to me, I'd rather see it eight or nine to have more flow and change that air over. Now, I think energy wise, sure. come January and February, we're going to see some real heartaches. But as far as our schools with what you said in the past uh, sometimes with these systems, we turn our air over pretty good. And if you're bumping it up to 30 or 40%, as big as these schools are, you know, with higher ceilings and auditorium and, and the, I mean, it's going to be a lot of airflow through. I mean, it's not, it's not like it's a stagnant. No, it, 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 there's a tremendous amount of air exchange within right. our, within our buildings. Um, and, you know, with that being said, we turn off the demand uh, ventilation systems which basically they're looking at the CO2 sensor. So it's gonna minimize the amount of outside air. We've turned those off so that we can control it manually and have it set at a percentage that's not gonna decrease and fluctuate like that. So, so as far as filtration and getting air for, uh, clean air in our systems, yes. I mean, we should be in really, I think schools are as good a shape as any other well, business. Sure, and if, you, I mean, and if you think about it, 
they're already designed, you know, to maximum capacity. And, you know, we may have 120 students in a school. We may have 60 or 70 students in a school. And it's, we're still running at maximum capacity of what. And, any, we, and when we go to AABB, we'll only still be at half capacity. That's, That's only 50%. So, I mean, we're well under yes, any kind of requirements. Mm -hmm. Kelly? Um, how do we screen when they walk into school? I, I'm going to leave that to Ms. Uh, Maria Fellers. She's the uh, nursing supervisor. Um, I, I, I mean, we did it all summer, right? We got kids in school in the summer. When they came in during the summer for summer school, yes. What did um, we do? They were, uh, they basically was a form sent out. And I'm just recalling this off the top of my head. A form was sent out to the parents basically stating, hey, if your student is going to be coming to school, you know, it's your responsibility to monitor that child, uh, your child. Um, at that point, when we were bringing them off the bus, um, Ms. Fellers did have it set up so that each child could be screened, you know, but again, you need to start questions. thinking about FERPA. You're asking yeah. the questions. The questions. Yeah, have um, you experienced, you know, and there are multiple symptoms on that doctor. And I think, to kind of go back to your part of your question, I, I think part of the concern is, you know, asking the student the questions in front of everybody else in, and I'm not an expert in this area, but the FERPA and, and all those things were, were discussed. But I can get Ms. Fellers to send you we her We don't, we don't take their temperature. I mean, when we start putting half the kids to school, how, how are we gonna do this? No, that was not the no, recommendation yeah. for temperatures to be taken. Okay, mm -hmm. so how, how do we do that when we start bringing? So it's an agreement that we're asking parents to say that you will not send your child to school if they are exhibiting whatever COVID symptoms. And so that is part, of, and that they don't have a temperature. And if they did have COVID symptoms or a temperature that you're not gonna send them to school with in, I think it's 72 hours now or something like that. So those questions are there or those points are there. And so we are asking that parents abide by them because we are trusting that they are going to be responsible with their children. MSDE is not has not created a requirement or even a recommendation that school districts screen students as they get on the bus or as they walk into, do temperatures, I should say, or as they walk into schools, that's not been part of it. What you do hear is that all children have to have a, a cloth mask, a face covering on, and that they, we respect those social distance or those physical distancing, um, and that they don't send them to school with those symptoms and, and those kinds of things, and that we do our proper cleaning and sanitizing. Those are the requirements that come from MSDE. None of them are temperatures. Okay, mm -hmm. I just didn't know. Yeah. But I thought we bought those forehead temperature and things. and we certainly we did. And we did do that over the spring for yeah. mm -hmm. each school has about six or seven of them because things are just changing all the time and you never know okay are you going to say require you to do it or not require you to do it so and we were doing that with all of our employees um mm -hmm. you know as they as they came six back. or seven of them in each school yes okay mm -hmm. the of the four um small group I, I know all this is going to change which mm -hmm. i understand what you told mm -hmm. us early on mm -hmm. of the four small groups though we had the iep ones and the special ed kids the els the ctes and you said a fourth group of i said students it. identified by school administrators okay. and, and in some that? schools that is those are students who just are struggling learners in some schools those are students who do not have access to stable internet at home so it just depends on what the school recognizes as a prioritized need so we wanted to leave that flexibility in there so that student and in some groups we are not um, students with special needs they have ieps that identify a least restrictive environment so they can't be in groups with all students that have IEPs so there have to be some gen ed students in some of those groups everybody doesn't have the same IEP but some of that is is um, involved with ensuring that we don't just have special education or ELL some general ed students are in those groups as well it wasn't um, anything to do with the curriculum like uh, like a ceramics 
some kids will come in because you can't do ceramics at home. Right. So the principals, they had conversation. We met during instruction, during Leadership Institute, and we determined what groups would come in. And it wasn't necessarily those groups um, because of so many other students that were prioritized. And so teachers are working with those students on projects or what have you. So it wasn't just the ceramics and, and that kind of thing. Um, it may all be a moot point. Um, at this juncture, because we will we will go back to the drawing board and we will look at our plan to determine how we'll respect the 50% capacity. We need to make sure that we can do 50% on buses. That's for certain. Um, but we'll go back to our plan and 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 reevaluate and make some adjustments. Okay, um, so we're ending right now. The reopening is this this is over. The reopening. This uh, we are entertaining any questions that you have. Well, I had a couple more on reopening, not, not necessarily yours. Oh, I'm fine. Hey, no problem. <laughs> right. Almost a clean getaway. <laughs> uh, the Team 4 had said that there would be social-emotional learning professional development. Did they have that? Yep. Because mm -hmm. I'm really worried about the kids coming yep. back. Yeah. Yep. Good. Okay. And each school will have social emotional learning components in their school improvement plan to ensure that it is not just district talk, but that is applied at each school. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the other one, I know you have the answer on this one too, is the, the, the MSDE back in the original plan wanted um, an, us to do an evaluation on the gaps early in the school year. I, I read what it was because I missed the last meeting. I apologize for that. A personal home emergency, but um, I read in there. I think I saw from Mr. Paluski that the gaps. We're not really doing a snapshot of where the kids are once we start school, right? We're we're doing the routine things that we do throughout the year, or how how are we handling that requirement? Right. So over the first few weeks of school, different grade levels are handling in different content areas in different ways. So we're using, and I know Mr. P is gonna say this, but we're using exact path for English language arts and math. Um, and so because that's well, nine, we're accustomed to it, we're working it that way. And um, I know that supervisors will be working with some teachers so that we can create or pull some assessments that we'll use for the other content areas. Um, Go ahead, Mr. Piano. Yeah, no, I think you just you said it very well. So uh, that is a requirement, Captain Kelly, that uh, all the school districts in Maryland have to do some kind of diagnostic. We do that naturally as part of the teaching and learning process, as part of our SLO development. So just a sidestep to that. There's no change in the teacher evaluation process. Um, you know, part of the SLO process is understanding where your students are at the beginning of the year, getting a chance to know them, getting a chance to know where their gaps are, and then developing your student learning objective based upon that. Um, what we've said to schools is take the month of September um, to, and, and schools have already started the diagnostic and this whole process. What we anticipate, and I've spoken with Ms. Forbes about this as well, is to anticipate sometime in October that we'll come to the board uh, with a snapshot of what we've learned through the month of September. Uh, so that we can communicate to the public and communicate to you where we see some significant gaps by a particular school. Uh, the other thing we'll share with you is all the students that are participated through our summer uh, mitigation, through our summer program. So at the high school level, those students that were receiving an I, where did they, did they complete there? Did they get credit for it? Did they get a pass grade? Did they get a letter grade? Remember, we've gone through four cycles. We're getting ready to finish cycle three. We're getting ready to go into cycle four, which will go through the middle of October. Uh, so I've already spoken with Mr. Kintop about that. So I would, I would anticipate the beginning of probably that uh, October that we'll come with a whole host of as much data as we have available to be able to communicate where the gaps are. Uh, but I believe that schools have a very good handle. Um, they want to know as well, right? So our leaders want to know specifically who needs the most help going into this school year where maybe um, there were some significant gaps, but we're hoping because of exact path, if they participated that in the summer, that there's not going to be as much as a gap or we've been able to fill that as we move into this school year. Right. One has to be able to mathematically assess a gap. Sure. Otherwise, there's no way of comparing sure. uh, gaps for this group versus sure. gaps for that group and so forth. So I would assume that what you're talking about is when you establish uh, 
it's just a, a numerical set of gaps. Yes. You can then compare it logically yes. uh, to what existed before sure. the virtual training, because there may be some gaps among groups that are typically not having gaps it be, it, because they can't learn virtually. So th there's some things sure. that, to track here that uh, well, and, and a new field. Correct. Cor so my response to that is going to be what what we measure are the standards, the curricular standards in which students are expected to know and be able to do by a given school year. So this diagnostic, which is completely tied to our standards in reading and, and language arts and math, will give us an idea where those students are by that. And that's done by uh, English is not the first language, uh, race, sure. and economically, to, you know, uh, deficient disadvantage yeah that's all the appropriate and the general ed kids too i mean sure absolutely it's, yeah, it's, we're going at all every, everybody we assess everyone that's but right i believe mr anderson is talking about how we disaggregate the data so that we can look at individual student groups i just want to make sure the parents knew that mm -hmm. but you also have to understand that there is going to be some no. gaps increase because of the virtual learning because there's students who just Will not Maybe new thrive. students that, that they will not thrive in that kind of environment and mask other gaps. So how do we? I mean, sure. And that was our remember that was our whole summer mitigation. We anticipated because of March 13th to the end of the year, we had some students that weren't engaged as much as we wanted them to be engaged. Many of those students were invited back in the summer, so we're anxious to see do we catch them up. Uh, you know, did we, did they progress and, and not fall behind? You know, nationally, there's always the, the summer reading loss, which nationally uh, happens, summer slot, as they call it. Um, so, I mean, we're going to learn a lot. Um, we're absolutely going to learn a lot as we, you know. What you're talking about is variance analysis, which is the only way you can find out how to stop gap slide. You have to know why it slid and it's not mixed in with something else. A very valuable tool and just because we know there's a, this group had a gap we have to know why because otherwise it'll repeat itself and we won't have the necessary uh, preventative just saying we've had on, on in that issue gaps but we've had a lot of students and parents that have worked very hard over the summer with their children to make sure they didn't fall behind and we're going to make sure that those kids are challenged too, aren't we? I mean, not. I know so, we'll spend our resources to catch up people that have, have fallen behind, but I hope we also keep an eye on the ball that the ones that are at level keep striving because some parents sure. I do know have spent a lot of time that, doing that. Great, great question. Great, great comment, Mr. Smith. And I know you and I had a long conversation one evening about this, about exact path, and that's the dynamic of it. So if I'm a student and with exact path, I can go two grade levels above where I am. That's the beauty of it. So it diagnoses you where you are and allows the individual an exact path uh, that's going to either help them accelerate or fill in those gaps. So I think students that have been on grade level as they've entered the summer and realize that they need more, that programs be able to provide that. So I feel very confident um, in that tool to be able to do that. And maybe as a suggestion that Ms. Forbes made, uh, maybe one of the next work session, uh, just a suggestion is do a tutorial of... Uh, Schoology, and maybe the other thing that we should do is do a little tutorial of Exact Path, so you can actually see it. You can actually see the diagnostic. You can actually see. I think that might be helpful for the board members. It might be helpful for the public as well. I think it'd be um, helpful for the public. I mean, the board needs to understand it, but I think our parents sure. of the students know what we're providing. Sure. Okay. Anyone else? And one more thing, Dr. Kane. I know that, um, and since you started with that, everything's going to change. Um, Hearing that SES starting on the 8th with 130 kids in the school, that's about half the student population of that school. It's 289. They'd be, I mean, it's exciting that they actually did that in the summer too. So they're a great model for how we 
move forward on this 50 percent thing so i think that's working because they had about 130 over the summer yeah although it, it's it's not a model that we can use for everyone because those students weren't on an a b schedule it's about a, almost half somewhere close to that um, in terms of capacity but what they were doing and how they scheduled their day would be a bit different i was just thinking the ways that they may have actually you know social distanced or how they passed it they did in the in the halls and you know that i'm you know we had a good test there with that school being mm -hmm. half of them in the school mm -hmm. and they start half in the school on the 8th of september also. they'll phase so, them in mm -hmm. okay great thank you okay would you like to take a break are you good? Um, I'll, I'm okay, but if, if you need to take uh, a Anyone break. else? Can we just keep moving forward? Yeah, may um, I make a comment first? I, I know things change and we might be bringing students more and more into our buildings. So this is more for parents and things that I've seen in my daily job. As we do this, parents need to be aware and maybe they've already seen that a lot of physicians offices are not open physically seeing their patients right. Point. and that is a huge concern that I have anytime you bring students back to school they're gonna be sick strep throat UTIs colds I have a huge concern and I think parents need to investigate this before it becomes an <coughs> issue if your physician is not seeing patients, I think it's time to reach out to them and encourage them to start because as we do open schools, these kids are gonna to need to be seen for the gamut of health issues, not just COVID. But I can see that being a huge issue of a child coming to school just sick from anything, mm -hmm. but they can't get health care. Mm -hmm. And not every family can afford to go to the ER right. or a walk-in clinic and pay that copay. That's a good point. So I think parents just need to be aware and start communicating with their providers um, the way they have been communicating with us about their concerns getting back into school. Valid point. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Local Every Student Succeeds Act, the ESSA Consolidated Strategic Plan. Ms. Forbes, come on down. I'm going to drive for This is going to be short and sweet. Thank you, Mr. Page. Good night. Good evening think she again. Has enough to do. <laughs> um, again, my name is Julie Forbes, Supervisor of Accountability, Assessment, and Data Management. Tonight, I'm going to give you a brief update on the local Every Student Succeeds Act Consolidated Strategic Plan. It does look different this year, so just to basically briefly touch on those updates and talk about those components. Uh, this just highlights some brief background on. Um, when, when the state, when we began implementing the local consolidated strategic plan, this is the second year. So 2019 was the first year and that was presented right around this time of year last fall. So the components of this year are um, much more streamlined. So it's going to include all of our federal and state grant applications embedded within those are the needs assessment that drive those plans. The other mandatory components are the sections required by COMAR. There is a section that discusses our gifted and talented plan and also the comprehensive teacher induction and mentoring plan. And educational equity um, is a COMAR requirement and equity needs to be woven within every single um, of those federal and state grant applications, really looking at it through that equity lens. Um, so from last year, the changes are quite significant. So there's no longer the very um, robust goal and content section that was required previously. So last year we you know, did a needs assessment, looked at data, identified goals and contents, much of that driven by the state assessments. And due to the absence of those assessments, that's one of the reasons why um, that section is not required. Instead, the emphasis is on the local school systems, the recovery plan. So the recovery plans that you have had presented to you um, throughout really um, since the spring, that is where the emphasis is. That is driving the goals of the school. Due to that, um, the direction for the ESSA plan is to really um, keep the, the keep the requirements there by the federal requirements but the focus for districts should really be upon that recovery plan which it has been for us and just quick update on the submission dates so our first draft of the plan is due october 15th and then the final is uh, due to the state by november 16th so you'll be bringing this to us the first 
meeting oh, in November? You know, and I'm sorry, we we can. It's no longer a requirement this year. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that, that is different. Sorry, I didn't highlight that. Yeah, it's um, the last bold under changes. Yes. There's no requirement to school boards or uh, county commissioners then to actually approve Okay. Because most, because remember, we didn't have all the data that we normally would have assessed mm -hmm. in the spring, is is not there. So they're just, it's a very pared back. Okay. So you'll just send it to us in, yep. before mm -hmm. submission. Okay. That is, that's fabulous. Yeah. Any questions? Oh. Any money come along with uh, these requirements? <laughs> Well, in, you know, there's always uh, federal money that's tied, you know, so when Ms. Forbes talked about our, our federal programs that we have to, so that's all of our, our Title I money that we get, our Title II money uh, for professional development, Title III, Perkins. So there is dollars attached to that, okay. federal dollars. Okay. And we just have to report on, uh, which we normally have to do really twice. We've got to do it here, and then they do it individually within each one of those. Counting. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I understand we don't have to okay this, and you know it's it's that's been waived. But we'll get a copy of it just so FYI we'll be up on what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. I believe I brought that up. Okay. Thank you. Thanks Great. for coming. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We are now at uh, five point oh three proposed superintendent goals for 2020, 2021. Put down here. Good evening, uh, board members. For the record, Andrea Kane, Superintendent of Schools. And I am sharing with you and the public tonight my proposed goals for the school year 2020 21. Uh, I changed some goals from last year. Some of the goals were didn't seem pertinent. Um, clearly, I am doing all of the professional development. If there was an exceeded, there was no point in continuing. That goal needs to be a new challenge. So my first goal, by June 2020, I'll engage stakeholder groups in planning capacity building activities centered on equity, diversity, and conversations about race. And that would include employees as well as students. Ways that I would show evidence of completion of that would be meeting agendas, meeting minutes, professional learning opportunities, uh, both internal and external, online, face-to-face, -face, and participation in conferences. Uh, I've had an opportunity to do a little of that already. By June 30, 2021, I'll conduct a crit critical examination of Queen Anne's County Public Schools policies and practices that disproportionately and negatively impact people of color. Mr. Paluski, earlier this evening, he shared with you a slide that showed various policies that need to be reviewed, and I will certainly be participating, obviously I do, in taking a critical look at those and any others that may apply to this category. Evidence of attainment of that would be meeting agendas, minutes, district data, revised policies, regulations that are under the authority of the superintendent, and written communication. Also under this category is uh, by June 30th, I'll communicate effectively with internal and external audiences about the operations of the district. This is a goal that has been on my um, goals for the last several years, and it is pertinent, and I thought that it was important to continue to keep that on there. Communication is significant. Now under student learning goals, I'll complete um, school monitoring visits. Of course, they will look different. 
and the data may be a little bit different, but it's still important to ensure that we have an instructional <coughs> focus at our schools. So I'll continue to engage with the instructional leadership team at each of the schools uh, to ensure that uh, goals include student, staff, and administrator performance, as well as community involvement. Uh, we do a presentation for the school board each year, and that will continue along with the um, meeting minutes, monitoring visit notes and artifacts, as well as agendas to verify attainment of that goal. Also under student learning, I'm looking at decreasing the percentage of students using paper learning packets by 50% across K through 12 during our virtual learning in comparison to the end of last school year. So what this means is last year, of course, we were caught by surprise and we had quite a number of students uh, working on paper packets and we want to discourage that back and forth. Now, it could very well be that we uh, need to revise this, um, this goal because if we're gonna be <laughs> back in school, but you know, it's important still because there will be those times where we have those transitions from virtual to face-to-face -face instruction that it's gonna be important that we're able to continue that in a virtual environment. As you know, we've talked about um, purchasing devices for all of our first and second graders. We believe that we've been able to move some dollars around with some of the uh, grants that we have um, you know, been offered an opportunity to apply for in terms of technology so that we can purchase devices for kindergarten as well. As I've visited schools for the past couple of days, I've run that by um, school teams that I've had a chance to talk with and they're excited about that for kindergarten. It just makes it a bit more seamless and some sort of consistent expectations across the, the grade level for kindergarten um, with kids not having to rely on a variety of devices that their parents have at home. So I've included that as a goal. Um, if it needs to be revised, it'll be revised. And looking at evidence for student enrollment, attendance, and participation data. The third one under student learning is um, by June the 30th, I will, um, students will demonstrate growth in English language arts and math, um, particularly among the lowest performing student groups, um, students with disabilities, African American students, Hispanic students, and evidence of attainment will be reading and math intervention data, a decrease in the percentage of students not meeting proficiency on district reading and math assessments. Um, so we'll continue, we'll use exact path, just like we talked about for English and language arts. The third goal is um, centered on district improvement. By June 30th, 2021, I'll ensure the alignment of the district's educational programs, plans, and resources with the district's vision and goal. You've seen this um, goal before, and I think that it is still pertinent. There are a variety of items here that we can consider as evidence toward uh, attainment of that goal. Some of it has to do with the, the budget. Some of it is uh, um, tracking our grants, what we've received, what we've applied for, um, and District Title I, Title II, Title IV plans. There are a variety of, of methods here that we can use to examine the evidence of attainment. Also in this section, I will demonstrate implementation of equitable leadership practices. I think this is still very pertinent. I'll show evidence of inclusive practices by expanding access and enrollment of non-traditional students in AP courses at both high schools. I'm happy to say we continue to offer equal opportunity schools at both high schools. We'll ensure the development of student learning objectives, SLOs, that are centered on improving student performance among African American and students with disability student groups, and demonstrate that evidence of equitable practices across the district's curriculum and instruction, human resources, student services, budget and finance, operations, and professional development. You notice that I've listed a variety of um, examples of evidence, that's that equal opportunity schools plans, professional development agendas, could be ANS meeting agendas, discipline data, budget and procurement documents, as well as some others. And the third goal under this section um, for district improvement has to do with um, 
myself and my leadership team and managing our fiscal and physical resources responsibly, efficiently, and effectively. Of course, our auditor's reports always come clean. We've had a recommendation or two over the years um, that we have always come back to the board to say that we have uh, resolved any issues. And we will continue to have our auditors con um, present their findings to you. And uh, I just met with TGM group and, and once again, a clean audit. Grateful for that. So we'll make sure that you get that information. Of course, our facilities um, management plans, maintenance plans, our capital <coughs> improvement plan, enrollment projections, financial reports, all of those things uh, will continue to be uh, shared with you as evidence toward attainment of my, of my goals. What you're looking at now is just that opportunity for you to mid-year, have your mid-year check, and that uh, references whether or not that goal or that section of goals was attained, whether I'm on track come mid-year or not on track, and any comments that the board would want to make uh, toward any of those three sections. At this, op at this time, I'm happy to uh, entertain any questions, concerns um, that you may have, additions that you would like to see included um, as goals that you have identified as important to the board. Dr. Payne, one thing, um, under B for district improvement goals, B, you have down there um, showing evidence of inclusive practices by expanding access and enrollment of non-traditional students in advanced placement courses at both high schools. I, I recommend you also put in there du dual enrollment courses, not just advanced placement. Um, cause what those, cause those students are finding, well, some don't do so well on the AP test um, and they can go to dual enrollment. We can encourage them to move into a dual enrollment also and they actually get a college credit for it. And they're finding that the AP program isn't necessarily as advantageous as if they did a dual enrollment. But, but both, both items should be something that should be non-traditional students to take advantage of. I am, happy, I am happy to work on that. We do need to consider that there is sometimes a cost involved with that. There's also an issue if they go back to face-to-face, -to -face, there's an issue of transportation. And those are factors that impact whether or not students are enrolled in those, not just because they can or they can't handle the level of rigor, but there are some factors that will impact whether or not students are part of those dual enrollments. That was one of the reasons why I didn't put that on there. But I'm happy to include that yeah. and share any commentary that becomes an issue. I think that could be, you know, to make an attempt to see if Absolutely. they want to do that. and. And, uh, and fund as much as we can. I just, I think it's important for the non-traditional students to try Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Happy to do that. Anyone else? Go ahead, sir. Uh, I'll just give this to Dr. Kane, but looking at practice goals, uh, this diversity conversations about race and ethnicity and disability. In other words, <clears throat> I'm adding those words. Oh, okay. Tell me where you are. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, professional goals A. Okay. And then just uh, include the typical groups. Uh, your emphasis is your choice uh, where there is problem, but conversations about race is there and ethnicity and disability. You know, with mainstreaming, we have children that maybe act out or do things. I think we need to cover the bases on that. Uh, and the same uh, addition would occur in B, um, uh, impact uh, of, of people of color, ethnicity, and disability. Just ideas. Absolutely. Otherwise, uh, everything else seems to be well covered. I would have two questions. Um, we are looking at um, helping students, Afro-Americans, Hispanics, and disabilities, but then on number 3B, you left Hispanic out. Is that any reason or just? You're in section three? B. I uh, probably about two thirds of the way down. Students with disability yeah. groups demonstrate evidence of equality practice of curriculum and instruction. It says improving students' performance among Afro-American students and disabilities, but leaves out Hispanic. I don't, was that just? Maybe I'm not in the same place you are. I'm in three, section 3D, and that talks about equitable leadership practices. 
Right. He's about two thirds of the way down from that yeah. paragraph. Yeah, under district improvement goals B. Should be. So w would you like me to add? I, I just, I mean, I mean, throughout this thing, we had uh, different groups that are needing help and I see Hispanic wasn't added on that one. I just didn't know why. I believe the term is Latin American. Latin American, population. whatever. I'm just using the same terminology they used in. Okay, because that's still a, a federal. Student Understand. Group Fine. Called, okay. Called a student group, but um, I will absolutely add that their their um, scores are not particularly as low as these two groups here, okay. which is why I had to add it. Okay. That, that's a good. But that's, I'm certainly happy to because we definitely monitor. If you don't feel it's needed, then that's I understand. I'm, I'm but, happy to put it in here. And I'm then the, the other thing is out in the public, the matter to me. The other thing I'd like to do is, I don't know where to do this, but CTE, career technology. Mm -hmm. I just, I know we've talked about this a year ago. We met Chesapeake College, had some good presentations. <coughs> the world's a little upside down right now with everything. But I'd love to see our goals somewhere in here to, in, to keep our CTE on track and improve. And we're doing a good job, mm -hmm. and I know it's a, a financial issue. We didn't hire the person we needed to this year to take it to the next level, but we just like to do what we can to make sure that program stays on track and do what we can because I think a lot of our businesses support it. Yeah, so what would the we goal had be? It, as it was a goal last it, year. We had it as a goal to increase the number of students in the apprenticeship program. Mm -hmm. and Right, exactly. And with them not being in school, that fell through. Right. So it's kind of tough to say whether or not they'll be um, in school. And that was specifically for the apprenticeship, the youth apprenticeship right. program. If you're talking about monitoring CTE, no. we do that and no, we I knew share you. No, that I'm with talking, you. If we get back, which we will get back to in school situation, then I'd, you know, I understand virtual we can't do it right now, but when we get back, which hopefully be shortly, we can get back and if it's available at that time. And I know that's a floating star because things change, like you said, every 24 hours, but I just don't want to be missed for another whole year. It, it's not missed. The program still continues as long as kids I'd can I'd like to excel it go. if we can. Yeah. I believe we had um, an email from Mr. Marsh, how it has, I think he's only got two students. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, and I think that goes back to that we're not in schools, right. you know? So but I don't mind not back. having it on here I think that's something that's it, it is would definitely still, be monitored. Yeah, it's definitely being monitored. It's still, a, um, you know, something that we, we want to make sure continues to happen. But, you know, as I hate to keep repeating myself, but as we know, when school closed, that went down, right? Mm -hmm. That went away. So um, families did not need to send their children to uh, a work site if they, because that's part of school and with school. I'm, is I'm just out. being <laughs> that we will be back in school at some point and we then, th then we will. do this. Absolutely. Okay. Any other changes to the superintendent's uh, performance goals for this year? I have a question. Yes. Um, the weekly report, are they going to start again? I miss them. I don't know if anybody else does. but Absolutely. As soon as I'm staffed on my executive team, we'll make sure that you get those. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's okay. good information. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, any, other, any other suggestions? Okay. So we have an action item on this. We... Um, do I have a motion to accept uh, the superintendent's performance goals for 2020-2021? As, as suggested changes. Right, with the addition with the, with of the, with as amended. With, as amended. As amended. Okay. So moved. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, motion is second. Any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to accept the superintendent's performance goals uh, for 2020-2021 as amended. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. At 832, can we please take a break? Is that all right, Mr. Yes. Strait? Please. Thank you. We'll be back in at quarter of nine. Thank you. As long as before bed, I'll, I'll share. Okay, thank you. We're back. Uh, 6.01 Human Resources Report. Do I have a motion to accept the human resources report that was presented in closed session? So moved. A second? Second. Questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to accept the human resources report as presented in closed session. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Now we have 6.02, policy for um, board approval. Employee travel policy number 315 and the regulation employee travel 315.1. Has everyone had a chance to go through it? 
Okay, do I have a motion to accept? I'll wait okay. for discussion. Okay, thank you. I have a motion to accept uh, policy title employee travel 315 with regulation title tra employee travel 315.1. Do I have a motion? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Questions, comments, discussion, Dr. Kane. I just wanted to add that there were no additional comments. <clears throat> thank you. That was my next question. My, my question too, do, did we have a, the second th page on here, talk, it has a checklist of the uh, stakeholders. Did we actually send it to the stakeholders? Absolutely. We have the X's on there and we got no comments back from them because nope. we, we say yes or no. I just wondered. No. Okay. Thank you. No, nothing and this rate will ties in the federal guidelines. So this could be a year to year thing that will the, the number could change only because of the federal whatever the reimbursement is. Correct. If the federal changes, then we change. And Correct. We, we can just change it automatically. And Correct. It's, if it's 54, 55, whatever the number is, it Correct. is. Correct. We change that internally, but the policy doesn't change. Policy doesn't change, but it, it, it adopts to the, the regulation of federal. Right. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. So no other questions or comments. I call for the vote on the motion to accept the policy employee travel 315, regulation employee travel 315.1. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Uh, purchase, let's see. Do I have a motion to accept uh, purchase approval of a 2021 Ford E350 cutaway with a custom Dihana body? Fiscal impact of $44,183.63. Budget source FY 2021 capital budget replacement vehicle. So I have a motion. So moved. I have a second. Second. Questions, comments, discussion. Mr. Pender. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> just seeking approval tonight for the purchase of the two uh, trucks that you uh, just described for the maintenance department. They will be replacing <coughs> uh, truck number 39, which is 16 years old, and also truck number 40, which is also 16 years old. Both have a high number of miles on them. Um, we are again uh, using the intergovernmental cooperative purchasing agreement from Montgomery County contract number 1065349. Um, this is the same uh, uh, cooperative purchasing agreement we've used for all of our other vehicles the past year. Okay, I see this is actually two. Yes, ma'am. There okay. are two of the same exact. And this falls within the budget that we had from the FY 2021 capital vehicle replacement, which was allowed <coughs> by the county commissioners. Yes, ma'am. Any questions? Anyone else good with this? Okay, I call for the uh, mo the vote on the purchase approval of the 2021 two of them Ford E350 cutaways with the custom Dehana body. Fiscal impact $44,183.63. Budget source of 2021 capital budget replacement vehicles. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Thank you. Thank you. I apologize. Let me finish this. Hi, Mr. Tolly. Good evening. Uh, sorry about the deadpan silence, Mr. Strait. Um, do I have a motion to, is this a purchase, sir? This is text the textbook adoption. adoption. Okay. So for the purchase of the updated <coughs> Myers psychology for the AP course, third edition, um, fiscal impact of $28,932.71 budget source, the capital textbook budget. Do I have a motion? I moved. I have a second. Thank you. Sure. Questions, comments, discussion, Mr. Tolley. How are you? Good. Good evening, Madam Good President, evening. Dr. King, members of the board. Mr. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for your assistance tonight. Absolutely. So this is uh, a textbook, updated Myers Psychology. Does anyone have any questions? It's replaced. I mean, it's it's AP. We're doing something we already have in in our program and. Will it get here in a time that, since it's a, uh, you know, it's in, but when we need it? 
Yes, sir. So, so with the AP books, the College Board recommends that we use resources that are no uh, older than 10 years old, and so we have passed that threshold. So we are actually, and we um, had a committee of teachers look at this uh, resource and other resources this summer, along with the other two textbooks that are up tonight, uh, and vet them. And they have digital, all three of them have digital resources that go along with them. They also have the ability to download an e-text onto the student laptops that can be accessed uh, when they're not, when they don't have internet access. So they have access to this now. The textbook companies have been um, very generous with, you know, with the situation that we're in. So we have, teachers have digital access, students have digital access to be able to, to try this out. So, um, and then the physical textbooks we will uh, receive in when, um, when they come. And so, but it, this is out for 30 day review. Mm -hmm. It hasn't, uh, hasn't gone out yet, right? Not yet. For so, this, so the this trial, a trial period with, uh -huh. yes. We get a trial period to say. Correct, yeah, absolutely. We, yes, we, we don't period. purchase them and the public will have 30 days to make absolute comments. And, yep. that, and we have that on our, and I know we can't come in here and get the books like we used to. Not yes. that anybody does, they should. Sure, but, sure. Uh, they do have the ability to come and get these books. They, yes, they can get uh, the digital resources can right. be posted online. So they, they have overviews. Each of the companies have overviews of the text features that are on there, table of contents that show what's actually in the book. So absolutely the public have access to that. Yes, sir. So I have a, a logistic question. These three books are actually supposed to be put out for public to see because I have them as action items that we are voting on them tonight. Textbooks for 30 day public review. This is our first okay. time seeing It'll be out for right. 30 okay. days. Okay. Mm -hmm. still first. Still do it. Okay, so I'm, I probably need to amend the agenda. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so putting out for public review, the updated Myers psychology for the AP course, fiscal impact uh, $28,932.71, uh, budget source, capital textbook budget. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it, the motion is carried. Putting out for public review, the African American Odyssey, seventh edition high, uh, high school, Addition, fiscal impact of $15,853.03. Budget source, capital textbook budget. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second? Second. Questions, comments, Mr. Tolley? So again, this textbook also has digital licenses which will allow access as well. Absolutely. And these will be sent out but for the public to see. Yes. Would we actually get to see them? They're gonna be some of them sitting over there. I can cer for I can certainly put the physical books here, uh, but and certainly digital access, um, you know, something. on our website, so everybody can see. Okay. Yeah, that would yes. be lovely. They're, they're all they're all very good books. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Any questions, comments, discussion? Hearing none, I call for the vote uh, for sending out for public review the African American Odyssey Seventh Edition High School Edition. Uh, fiscal impact dollar amount of fifteen thousand eight hundred fifty three dollars. Three cents, tech, uh, budget source, capital textbook budget. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Motion for sending out for public review the Magruder's American <coughs> Government grades 9 through 12. Fiscal impact dollar amount $30,475.12. Budget source, capital textbook budget. Do I have a motion? Moved. A second? Second. I have a motion and second. Mr. Tolley, again, this is a new textbook digital license being sent out so the public can see this. And this is also in over 10 years old. So that's why Correct. we're doing with a new renew. Okay. And, and all three have uh, six year licenses that go with them. So we purchased them now and we have six years oh, of nice. uses, which does make it nice. So, so we are not you know, continuing to turn overturn resources and students have that continuity and teachers have that continuity. So they become uh, used to that, you know, used to that platform. Oh, that's great. Okay. This particular um, American government one, <clears throat> I think I read it, but I can't remember. It, it coincides with the the actual assessment that is required of our tenth graders. It does, and this and this book is uh, the newer version of the book that we actually are using now, the Magruder's book uh, with a copyright, I believe, of two thousand three. So this is. Um, significantly out of date, so this is gonna really uh, bring us up to up to speed. And the teachers um, that reviewed really like the Magruder's book and they like you know how um, how the features are there. They, they really like the digital platform and, and so I think the students 
uh, if it's approved, we'll really, really enjoy that as well. Do you, though on the assessment that is required, the graduation requirement, that is put out by MSDE, is that right? Yes. So is this going to it aligns. get them ready for that, to be aligned for Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Okay. And, and so we, and you know, we use that textbook as a, as a resource to support um, you know, student learning to, to be prepared for that exam. Okay. And so we take that textbook and, and you know, we, uh, we build our curriculum around, you know, the standards that come out from the state of Maryland and that, you know, support that uh, MCAP government exam. Okay, thank you. Okay, anything else? Okay, I call for the uh, vote on the motion for to send out for public review, the Magruder's American Government grades uh, nine through 12 textbook. Fiscal impact dollar amount of $30,475.12. Budget source, capital textbook budget. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Thank you, Mr. Tully. Thanks Thank for coming tonight. Yeah, Appreciate it. Good evening. Good evening. Happy, happy Labor Day. Thank you. you too. Uh, next is information items. Transfer notice I have here from Mr. Fister. There are no operating budget transfers for the month of August 2020. It's the last thing with his signature on it. I'm so sorry to see that. Um, future school board meetings. We have one on September 16th, school board work session. And then again, our, our regular meeting is October 7th, the first Wednesday of the month. So I guess on the 16th, we'll get an update on the update. On we'll the get update. an update on the update. We'll have um, some information for you to sort of, we'll walk through exact path and Schoology okay. for you. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. Anything else that we're supposed to be? Well, hopefully we'll have a committee, a policy committee meeting soon so we can get some stuff started and get some things <coughs> on the agenda. Um, I have one thing. To, go ahead. The, up, the update on the update, <laughs> like the way you said that. Um, I just want to say that in, in light of the governor's new guidance and MSDEs, um, I understand that you're going to re-engage the Tiger teams to come up with a plan to to follow well, along with what they say? I, I may not need to re-engage the Tiger teams. I've got to talk with exec team first mm -hmm. um, because they've done the heavy lifting. They've created a 50% capacity plan for us already. They've done the A day, B day schedules. Those were presented to you and those are in the recovery plans. So I don't need to send them back to the table for that. Mm -hmm. But once I talk to exec team and we talk about transportation and, and all of those kinds of things and get some questions answered from MSDE, I may have to engage the Tiger team or I may not. So it really depends on what information and questions are still out there. We knew you had the AABB for elementary, but um, you had a different thing going with middle and high. Um, Look in so there, you'll see that it's a, it's in there. The A day, B day for middle and for high. middle and high. Mm -hmm. Look in where? I'm sorry. The, the recovery plan, the reopening the, and recovery you, plan. The one we have out. Correct. Okay, I, I missed it. It's so. in there. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, um, and then uh, I also just want to let you know that I'm pleased that we got that work going with the Tiger teams. We have a checklist now that, mm -hmm. you know, some well-developed checklists we can mm -hmm. work toward. Are you getting an idea of, you know, what, what the, your, what thought process you have as to when we might be able to actually en enact those changes? Oh, I don't have an idea. I, I need to have some conversations first with my team, and then I need to find out what questions we still have for MSDE. So it's not going to happen like tomorrow. I understand. Yeah. I just want to get a general idea. A couple of weeks. Okay, mm -hmm. a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Okay. So by the 16th, we'll, we'll be poised to share with you what we know at that point and, and what we want to do, you know, in terms of changes. Okay, great. You're Thank welcome. You. Well, I, mean, I printed this out, which was sent out August 27th. Yeah, you know. And now it's, um, I can use it for scratch paper because... Um, we get everything after the fact. So. Yeah, there, so. is a, is, there is a guidance on the, te the posit positivity test rate. Um, so, I mean, are we... Are we actually engaging the, the health department, Ms. Dr. We, com we absolutely this? communicate with the health department. Mm -hmm. As we were speaking, I got a, a text message from Ms. Fellers, our, our nurse supervisor, and it shared with me a link to, um, you know, which was just put out on the 28th of August over the weekend from the health department, which doesn't say anything different from what we just had a conversation about, but just confirms that parents are asked to screen their children okay. before they put them on the bus, which is not different from, from what we've already said but it's um august the 28th that just came out yeah. no but i'm seeing it um this is the uh, the guidance they were given for health based on our positivity rate and i don't know you know this is what 
well, this came out from MSDE and uh, the governor of, not last, this week, but the week before. So um, and now I that's was just, changed. and yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know that that's changed, but my question is though, how, how are we, Dr. Ciotola is coordinating with us on the decision process, right? Of how we put the No, case we in. share with him what it is that we're planning to do. We really wanted to engage Dr. Ciotola in our tiger team work, right? Mm -hmm. So that he could be a part of that. He was not able to do that. Okay. And so now it's just, we refer back and forth to the health department, sometimes to him directly. Ms. Fellers is very instrumental in that. Um, I've had some conversations with folks at the health department, um, particularly if we have a suspected case, which thankfully, you know, we did not. Um, um, but that's how we engage with them. Uh -huh. They don't make the decisions for us. We decide what we're going to do. We ensure that we're okay, you know, from a health perspective with the health department. Right, which would be the guidelines that he's given to the health departments are given. Okay. okay. All right. And the state, the state has not, I mean, we're, we need 50% occupancy to work our plan, AABB. The governor has allowed 50% capacity. He has. Then in the schools. Next, the, in I don't school. know about the buses yet. That, that's that's going to be the next, my, that was my next follow-up. If we, we need to get 50% to get up to 20, 25 students on a bus before. We need, we need half capacity on buses. But that's we also we talked about if parents could help bus Absolutely. bring, you know, Save that Absolutely. we'd have to understand it. If we don't get that, we're going to have to ask the community to help with public transportation or scoot transportation. Is it 50% of the entire population of the schools or is it can we like for instance uh, it was mentioned that uh, I guess one of, one of the people testifying and I've seen the same data although whether I interpret it correctly is not clear but children under 10 uh, are very unlikely to get this COVID virus but I'm not sure that that's proven, but if some official, not the governor, because he's changed his mind uh, on a dime, uh, we can't even get a memo out describing what we're doing before it gets changed again. And that, by the way, is uh, some of the notes that went in during the state uh, board of educations, uh, even what they were doing uh, was a turn on a dime. Things are moving too fast to try to catch up and, and decide. We ought to just wait till everything slows down and we actually have a set of facts and we can move ahead in a safe, orderly, uh, and effective way. None of this, you know, rushing out to try to be the first people to do something and end up being the example of why it shouldn't have been done. Let somebody else do that. Which is one of the main reasons why we didn't rush to change what we presented tonight. We just had we just got it. I hadn't even seen Mr. Once Pender burned, we shy. Right. So we, we just need to ingest what we've received, yep. ask our questions, get questions answered, yep. and then make some decisions about what needs to change. My direction to principals that I visited today, don't change anything right now. We'll let you know when you need to change because they're wondering, what do I do about my small groups? Keep planning for your small groups. Sure. We'll let you know when we need to change because it's just too soon to send everybody into a tailspin, really, because that's what, what happens. The worst thing that can happen is to open up 50%, which sounds like A and B, which is outrageously expensive, and then after it runs for three or four weeks, we have a surge in the pandemic and somebody says it's the schools opening, which has happened everywhere else. And we have to shut back down again and start over again. Where is the credibility of decision-making? Nothing that gets beside, decided is going to please everybody. And the objective is not to please everybody, it's to do it right. Safely. And safely. And that's, uh, yeah, what I think, uh, that's what I think we're doing as a board and the staff are going to make some recommendations and then we'll make some decisions on what, on our, what we feel is best interest of the system. And Not. the 50% rule is for the school building. Correct. The buses, you still have to maintain your six-foot social distancing, which makes the buses impossible to do 50%. So unless that is lifted, that's what's throwing a monkey wrench in this whole thing. Well, that, The six-foot that, distancing makes it very difficult to do anything 
but that's why we logical. well we need to need to talk it through because I'm not saying we can't. There are so many parents that we're going to take their kids. They made that clear, and if we can, uh, we're, we may have to go to each individual family and ask them. You know, are you riding the bus and do you and you or sign a form that you're not going to ride the bus, which we've had before. I mean, we're, but we're that's what now. we may end up having to do, and I'm willing. That, that we go ahead and do that, take that kind of effort in a small county like this to be able to get that 50% in school and not just use the buses as a... We, we know, we oh, might I not agree. be... And the SNAP cash. code form that we fill out at the beginning asks that very right. question. It just can be revisited through that form. It should be, re yeah, but I think maybe revisited not in, only in that form because they fill that form out not knowing that they, they may have the option to drive their kids to school to be able to get them into school. That's, that's but feedback that I'm getting form from would tell you the individual family because of their law going. Correct. If you they just do a be, survey, they, it's going to be a blind be, survey. I'm just saying they need to be contacted because filling out that form when school started, there was no idea we'd be able to go right back to school. But they could go back into that form and update it. That's what I'm saying. Right, right. Okay. We're on the same page. Yep. Sorry. And uh, there's a lot of families that do not have the resources to be able to drive their, their students to the schools. So we have to be mindful of that. We do. But there's a lot of families who don't have resources to, to teach their kids at home, too. That's true, too. I mean, that there's a whole gamut of, of things. But I just issues, don't want to ignore so the to. fact. I'm sorry. I just didn't want to ignore the fact that they've actually come forward and said, I want to, to do this. So, And the percentage that I think that you talked to are the percentage that have the wherewithal to do that. I'm just putting it out there that there's a, a greater number of folks who don't have those kind of resources. So, well, we're not slow, and sure, slow and sure, slow and sure for everyone. Right, equity, safety, and safety. Okay, anything else? Any other, anything else for the good of the order? And I, I just wanna clear up it. I think it's a total misnomer to say children do not get sick. They, children are getting sick. They may not get as deathly sick as some of the adults, but they do get sick and they can spread it. So that's the concern. It's not that they won't get sick and they can come to school safely and they're going to spread it. Kids get sick every year. Some kids, I hope, do not succumb to it, but you can't predict. But they're going to carry it home. They're little Petri dishes. They're going to carry it home and they're going to spread it. And they're So says the nurse. Pink eye, strep throat. They're spreading it. They're, they're just spreading the love. We're all Petri dishes fans. to you. Yeah. <laughs> It's going to happen. <laughs> it's going to happen. It, it is. It is. Okay. Nothing else? All right. Do I have a motion to go into executive closed session? And we're suit to general provisions of Article 3-305 and 3-104. I move the board meeting closed session to discuss performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials of a motorized public body as jurisdiction to consult matters to relate to negotiations and to confer with counsel. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote to go into executive closed session. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. We will close out of executive closed session. Mr. Strait, thank you all for being here. Have a happy and safe Labor Day weekend. Good night.